Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Director Watch, an awards watch podcast that attempts to get inside the mind of cinema's greatest auteurs, explore what drives them. Maybe we go on a few unrelated tangents along the way. I'm Ryan McQuaid, the executive editor here at Awards Watch, and joining me as always is my conductor slash co-host, Jay Ledbetter. I can't believe it, Ryan. Last Tony episode. I know. Can you believe it? Hasn't this been fun? This Isn't has been, so, just this has been all, so much all fun. The Tony Scott episode, uh, movies. Yeah. Well, yeah. Chugga chugga. And doing the episodes too. Yeah. Chugga chugga choo choo. And then, yeah. Unstoppable. Um, we're doing it. We're doing it. Because the um, last film in Tony Scott's filmography. This episode is going to be as big as the size of the Chrysler building. Yeah. It, it's my it favorite. is. This One is going to be truly... the 777. <laughs> That's how long it's going to be. Seven hours, seven, seven minutes, minutes seven, seconds. seven seconds. There you go. Um, I'm really excited, buddy. We're going to be talking about Unstoppable, this last film, obviously, in yeah. Tony Scott's filmography. We're going we're gonna to talk with our guest here about this movie in depthly, and we're going to also give out our rankings. Yeah. Which I actually... Tough ranking. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it was tough to do this ranking, and also for the first time on the show... I actually think we're going to have a little bit of a difference in the order. Maybe not at the top, yeah, but definitely we'll, we'll see. definitely in the middle and the end. I think that I think there's going to be a, a lot of maneuvering. Um, and then we also have to announce at the end of this episode who we're going to be covering starting next week, which I'm yeah. really excited about. Super nervous uh, about it as well. It's a, it's a daunting task. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. But Adam McKay. Oh, no, 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 no. I was thinking we're more like doing, we're only doing late Adam McKay. Oh, we're only doing Adam. McKay. We're, we're only starting at Vice. Yeah, and we're it's a two film series. We're starting a Big Short, which is oh, a good movie. Which is a good, movie. but that's serious. And then, McKay. and then Vice is an abomination. And then you didn't like Don't Look Up, right? No, 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 not at all. No, it's a movie that no one should like. More like, but hardly kept me from looking at my phone. Oh, that was, man, that was really tough. Because it's on streaming. Oh, okay. I get what you're saying there. That was an aggressive pull for a joke. Um, I think it worked great. You know what? With that in mind, uh, to pull this train of an episode along, we can't just have ourselves. We have to have a guest. No. We've had a guest for this entire series. It's only right that we have one to finish off. And I'm very yeah, excited. Crazy. Every episode. Every episode. Yeah, we wow. had to maneuver a lot of people's schedules. Mm -hmm. um, and our guest today works with us here at awardswatch.com. It's actually the first time they've been on this show, but I'm really excited to have them on this show, right? It's the first time you've been I on the show, right? Yes, I believe so. so. Second time? What was Second. the first time? Second time? First time? Are we wrong? Are we wrong live on air? We gotta fact check this. Anyway, no, keep, Kevin uh, keep, Kevin keep, Lee keep, is with us talking. here today. Kevin, is this the second time we've had you on here? Hi guys. First of all, I just want to say I, I I should be wearing a yellow vest in this really situation. Greg. <laughs> <laughs> and it may be my second time because I think I did Ridley Scott. Well, that was on our old show. So on oh, Director yes, Watch, yes, we yes, revamped. Yes. So yes, Kevin was on our old series for Ridley Scott over at In Session Film. And here at Awards Watch, so he is he's completing the circle with the, yes. uh, with the Scott brothers. So that's what it was. See, the Jay's like scrambling and being like, where's in the notes? He also did Cloud Atlas with us back in the day. That's true. That's true. God, uh, what a good movie. What a, um, what a good movie. And then you talked, he was talking with Gladiator with us. That's what yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I guess, Kevin, I actually haven't asked you this question, but I oh. think that this is a good one to start off. All right. Um, Scale of one to ten, how excited are you for Gladiator Two? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking the tough questions to you. That's a good question for all of us. Um, yeah. uh, actually, maybe yeah, uh, Jay, you can answer after him. Yeah, uh, four, four, four. Wow, how? Four. Why? Um, I, I have to preface by saying Gladiator is still one of my all-time favorite films. So that's that your favorite it, release is odd. One, it's one one of my all-time favorite films. It's like for for me personally, like a film like Gladiator, it's it's just it's it's a film that has best picture written all over it. It's like it absolutely deserves that win in in my eye. So to 
to have like a sequel to that decades later like this it's like okay uh are we are we top gun mavericking this or is i'm i'm just super super skeptical about it mm. um they they recently just released these uh new still images and i i do have to say the still images they, they look, look great good. they they look, they look great um i i personally think the the denzel picture got me hyped up a little bit yeah um, well, we're going to talk denzel yeah uh so but I, i'm still skeptical and worried overall which is why i have it out of four it, it used to be lower <laughs> yeah jay where are you at Let's i'm at, one I'm at like a seven yeah i'm uh i'm pretty excited for it i don't gladiator is second or third tier ridley for me i still think it's really good mm. but and crow it's probably second tier it's probably and crow it's, is, it's um, second tier it's second yeah tier. crow is it's right in there with the counselor you know um it's right up there with like the martian you know what I mean? Ugh. Uh Crow is incredible in that film. It kind of stinks that he won't be in it. Look, he's you know, I'm not gonna besmirch the man, but he's not exactly in Maximus shape anymore. Oh, he's uh, in he's in Pope's exorcist shape. He is you know in I mean? he's in <laughs> nice guy shape. It's crazy that he's in actually I don't the Pope's nice Exorcist and he's in the exorcism in the just Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Mike Flanagan, put him in the Exorcist movies. He has been, he has turned into a B movie star. Fiend. It's weird. Yeah. It's, it's really weird. weird it's weird. Because one of the biggest movie stars. He had the juice. He had the yeah. pulse. Uh -huh. And now he's, and now he's got the pulse for direct to video. He was Mr. Yeah. Movie. He's one step above direct video to be. Because mm -hmm. he did that. What's it called again? He did that road rage movie. Oh, unhinged. Good unhinged. Movie. Look, unhinged. You're talking, you're yeah, talking to yeah. the unhinged defender. Yeah, yeah. It's like I like it's, that movie. It's almost like he started picking roles that normally would have gone to Nicolas Cage. It feels like kind Gerard. Of. It feels yeah. like Gerard Butler passed, and he said, "Sure." You know what no, I mean? You know what I'm trying no, to say? No, that's not fair. That yeah. is not fair. No. That's a little fair. Gerard Butler could not pull off unhinged. Gerard Butler does, mm, but could, large but could Russell Crowe trash? But could Russell Crowe do what is what was the like uh, three hundred? No, 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 no. Like that was it. Bio biosphere or some crap? I don't know. Greenland. Yes, Greenland. You think oh, you Greenland? Greenland. Yeah, I, I thought you were talking about what plane? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do Do you think? Do you think <laughs> Russell Crowe could do the Phantom of the Opera? Well, that's old. That was when. Yeah, yeah after I, I think he could. <laughs> I think guy. it would be an abomination like Les Mis, but, but anyway, I, I would say I'm at about. I was at about a three, and then I saw wow. the I saw the stills, and I'm like, See, I'm I'm, still I'm like, like at a, in on late Ridley. I still haven't no, seen Napoleon though. I gotta tell you, but Jay, I gotta tell you, I think I'm at an eight. Wow, I think because of the those, stills, the yeah. stills do it for me. I love. Like Denzel serving like super, super sassy man, bad guy. I like mm -hmm. I like the way they look. It looks super bloody and super, super violent. And Paul, yeah, it's almost. I like need it's a it. Sequel to Gladiator. It sounds like a secret. Yeah, but like there's parts of that movie that you know we talked about the visuals a lot with that. I one, just think it that goes is back and forth, but a sort of sloppy movie yeah but it's uh, really good know. kind of just, big hollywood maybe it's like, because i've also bought the stock of paul mescal a lot and i looked at him in this and i was like god damn he looks like a movie star in this thing i kind of need a little proof of concept with mescal he can sell wow. me he you're can totally get sell fired. me but you're gonna get we'll, fired uh, around here. We'll, we'll see you say that around eric you're gonna get fired what yeah. is the movie star performance from Mescal so far? You mean the one? Uh, well, are you talking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not fair. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> are you talking? So, how are you trying to qualify? Are you saying is he a good actor? Or are you trying to put him as a movie star? Like, what are you well, trying do, to do? Here? Let's do both. Well, if he's a good actor, it's the Oscar nominated one that he has in After Some, which you're yeah, cold there's on. never been anybody nominated for a bad performance, let alone won an Oscar for a bad performance. That's one that generally I, everyone he's, loves he's, and it's considered one of the I best like performances of the decade. So, but yeah. he is he is quite good in it. Yes. And he's also incredibly good in in all the strangers last year too. Is I thought his chemistry with Andrew Scott was fantastic. Um it's a smaller role, but again, that's the one thing about that movie, Andrew Scott blows him out of the water, in my opinion. 
but well, I think that they he's both pretty good. Did. I think they're all really good in that movie. That's a great ensemble there. Andrew Scott um, is so good in that movie. But I mean, like he's young. He's still very young. You know what I mean? It's, it's no, he uh, is very young. He's very young, and he has doesn't have nearly as much. Like I mean, let's see him pull off Wonka. That's what I say. <laughs> I think really, Wonka is truly. I mean, that is the test of all tests to say like to someone. Timothy Chalamet is a movie star, and they're like, "No, he's not." And then you just be like, "Well, Wonka made six hundred million dollars yeah. worldwide, so shut the hell <laughs> it up." Is, it is you crazy. know what I mean? Like, it's one of those where it's just like, "Let me put this on." It's honestly, Wonka is one of the more fascinating things that's ever it happened actually at the box is office over from a commercial movie. standpoint. Yeah. yeah, it's it is like I think you know that what movie it just stinks. Not to, I think it not stinks. to not to make this comparison, but like. When you talk about like the power of somebody like Leonardo DiCaprio and how mm -hmm. Chalamet is always compared, I think a lot with Leo with The Revenant, a movie that like made so much goddamn money and had no business making that much, and nobody else I think could get that money. Yeah, made. but that one's like an art house. No, I don't know. there was a little bit of built-in IP. But although... how many art house awards movies do we see? that have people in it, Jay, and then they fail or they middle. At no, the for box sure. Up. But Chalamet That's hasn't a... had an art house sensation. Ooh. Right. Well, I he mean, hasn't, he hasn't. Oh, you mean like, are you talking about like at the box office? Yeah. Because yeah. like cult critically and probably culturally, it's called Revenant name, did but, you know. incredibly well. Yeah. But like Wonka and Dune now, like, I mean, he's well, Dune is, is box like, off. yeah, it's kind of a I mean, little Dune artistic. Is a yeah. Timothy Chalamet is a movie star. He's I've a movie turned star. the corner on him, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm there. He can get, yeah, and I would be interested to see what he does next. I, obviously, not Wonka and, and do movies the rest of his life, but Unstoppable too. Well, I mean, still Unstoppable. I don't know. I've, I've always felt that Wonka did really well financially because of like counter programming plus the lack of like enormous titles during the winter that year. Kids movies if, right now. Because if you look can't. at um, if you look at the movies that made at least four hundred million dollars worldwide that year, only two of them. Of, came out in the winter. They were Wonka and then Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Did that oh, make yeah. Did that make money? It made, well, it made it made over four hundred million dollars. Money. Oh, okay. Because like that was For the only that movie. It was like it, it, if it came out and they had actually advertised. Oh, because they're killing off that part it, of the yeah, franchise. It, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it was like that is you know what we made money on it, but it wasn't a sensation. It wasn't like Black bye Adam bye or Jason Momoa or yeah. Shazam or. Or what was the other one? Blue Beetle, where they just were like, we don't care. Do you remember how huge the first Aquaman was? Yeah, it was enormous. And it it's a good movie. A billion. Yeah, yeah that movie's fun. Yeah, it's it's actually best, pretty good. It's yeah, the best one, good. in my opinion, in that, I, in I think, that yeah, DC. I thought the second one was pretty bad. But. Yeah, well, I, I never saw it. Because at a certain point, when you tell me that your franchise is over, I'm not going to watch your franchise anymore. Right, exactly. What's the So point? you're just telling, it's it's the, hey. $400 million worth of people still it's the, uh, disagree with you there. I, I know, I know. But it's also the, hey, well, our Pixar movies are going to be on Disney Plus soon. So you condition the audience to not go and see them. And then you have to reprogram them to be like, actually, you need to go see them in the theaters. And uh, and then now they have the number one movie of the, of the year. I can Inside Out 2 is blowing my mind how successful it is. Yeah, but also too, look at it's how not blowing my mind at all. I saw this coming from a mile away. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have guessed a billion and it's going to make like a billion and a half. The first the first one almost made nine hundred million dollars. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. it's we're going to get a third one of these pretty soon you Thank know it's gonna God. i mean listen i'm just so i'm not i'm not a big fan of them either ever i've seen both and i'm not I a saw, big fan i haven't of them. seen the second one the first one is like a would you say that it's movie for would me. you say that it's like i guess this generation's toy story like the newer yeah. generation yeah i i guess yeah. i guess it's, I guess it's so. fair it it's to fair be. to say i mean it, it has say it. it has the similar um story structure as toy story where yeah. like it's two two people who don't really get along and then they're suddenly stranded and they need to get back to where they came from, you know, all at the service of a child in, in toy story. It's Woody and buzz need to get back to Andy's house and inside out it's joy and sadness need to get back to headquarters. It's the same yeah. structure, you know, yeah. and then it has the same kind of large ensemble cast of incredibly characters. creative yeah. and memorable and it's a characters. metaphor for growing up. And yeah. Yada, yada. yeah. So what we're saying is Pete doctor is a hack and, uh, <laughs> 
and uh, how was has been aren't they doing toy story 5 yeah and they I'll are see it. I'll, yeah and i'll fucking see I it God yeah damn it. i mean i'll see it for sure but. i mean i i will test i don't think any of the toy story movies are bad when and was the last truly great pixar movie oh that's a last, good question what was the last one that Coco? is a good question Coco. Well, I love Coco, Coco is but it's personal on great. I wouldn't it's, say it's personal. I, to me. I, I will say personal my me. son loves watching Coco. Coco is really good. I liked Luca a lot. That's yeah, what Luca's that was not great. No, I think yeah, the, I, lo- I, mean, I, I think love it's very Luca, emotional. but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in top tier, Jay. I don't, you know, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to is, think. is Wally the last great like out now? No, masterpiece? I, no I, I, I would have Coco in there. For sure. Probably Coco's up there. Like, I'll, yeah, I'll accept Coco as the answer. I'd probably go further back than that. Is Wally, is Wally that? I would have to look at the... Wally you know, is super I asked the question back. and don't have an answer. Yeah. yeah. Way to, ask, way to be a podcast host and ask a question and don't have a damn answer for it. God. It's, like you're, it's you're all supposed, about starting a conversation. You're supposed to be a professional. You're supposed to be a professional around here. God damn it. Um, don't be the guy that leaves the lever... And then the train just goes uh, off the tracks. I think Toy Story three is pretty great. Oh, oh that's right. That's After, right. Toy Story. 3. Oh, you know what? You know yeah. what? Yeah. I. So I'm Shit, one of the weird people who prefers Finding Dory over Finding Nemo. So really? I really like so Finding Dory. I, so I, I, I actually would say um, uh, Finding Dory and Coco since they're back to back. Well, that, and the thing about the thing about Pixar and this is this unstoppable podcast is really oh, I actually love great. Incredibles too. Um, <laughs> is is. <laughs> Is <laughs> we have all lost our train. Yeah, thoughts. yeah, exactly. I'm there actually saying Incredibles too. I backtrack. Yeah, that's Incredibles right. You too. really. I mean, I wasn't I'm a big fan of Incredibles too. Defender Stan, but I, I I like a lot of ideas about it. I think it's like I wrote an entire fun. article. Actually, my very first article for Film Inquiry was about why Incredibles two is disappointing. <laughs> oh, uh, because it's great, <laughs> and you wanted it to be bad. No, it's. I wanted it to be great and it's fine. Yeah, it's great. yes, that's it's it. so good. That's, that's the it. problem. It's like it's such a it, but it I is will take so much stuff at, at you. It but is I will, so ambitious. I haven't seen it since and I Brad Bird is just a visual mastermind. See, why don't they hand that's true. the key why don't they hand the keys to Pixar to Brad Bird and not Well Brad Bird's doctor? out of Pixar now. How about oh, they, they just kick him out? And, He's well, left. Actually, he, he left. Actually, I was about to say, how about bring back Andrew Stanton? But isn't he mm-hmm. doing Toy Story 5? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, Brad Bird made like two of the best top, like top three. I think arguably the two best. Yeah, from most people. I mean, like his average is, you know, with the Incredibles. And then, I mean, Ratatouille is a masterpiece. I think Ratatouille is number one. Yeah. I have the Incredibles number one. But I can, but I can't argue with anyone saying Ratatouille up there. Toy Story two, that one's up there for me. I love, I love, I love these movies. But yeah, I I would like them to go back to it being, I don't know, a little bit more original, a little bit more emotional, and not feel like the same things over and over. Again. It's hard. They've well, been they've well, been Disneyfied. The well, that's the thing. It's that I I love Luca and I love Turning Red and like. I, I still think both those movies would have played beautifully if they went into theaters, but you know, here we are. A pandemic for you too. Here we pandemic are. for you. And I, I also, I mean, I, I'm not crazy about it, but I defend Onward more than most people do. No. And like Onward got hit really <laughs> badly because because it was like right when the pandemic like really Chase face. Hit. No, we're not doing that. On- yeah, Onward is yeah. <laughs> You can you can keep onward. I'll have um, I'll have the, too. Another another hot take of mine is I is for Pixar movies that came out in the year 2020. I prefer Onward over Soul. I prefer The Good Dinosaur to Inside Out. Oh my god, that's that's a lot, and that's, I don't even that's, love that's, Inside that's the that's truth. A lot. That's the truth, Ruth. Yeah, one's um, one's just simple and beautiful, and the other one is complex and stupid, and that's Inside Out. Um, so there's, I got a, I got a whole list. One of these days I'm going to write it and it's going to blow people's minds. My it's opinion. a great unstoppable it's episode. A, it's a really great unstoppable <laughs> episode. The final <laughs> episode in our the last Tony time Scott. We'll ever, yeah, cover a Tony Scott <laughs> This is great. And we've decided to go down whatever fucking rabbit hole this thing is. Um, Kevin, thank you for yes. being here mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. to, to be a part of this. 
Uh, I got to ask you some questions. I'm going to transition. Sure. To go to host yes. The actual meat of this. I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, obviously, um, I know Kevin's a big fan of this movie, so we we don't have to we don't have to go really too hard into that. But what's your relationship with Tony Scott as a filmmaker? What do you like about him? What you, what don't you like about him? And for the last time, Jay, I'm going to ask our guests the question I've been asking every single guest on this show. The most important question. The most important question, really, the thesis. It's a little of, bit of a leading question. Yeah, yeah it's of a this, good question. And, but it's a good question. We've had d- different answers. You can only pick one. Are you picking the Riddler, Ridley Scott, or are you picking who we have donned as the tone setter, Tony Scott? You can only pick one. Oh, that's actually a really good question. Um, yeah, my, my relationship with Tony Scott is, number one, I have not seen all of his films. Um, well, pause. And, we're going to just go and watch all those right now. And, we'll be back in a little bit. And in a funny way, like Tony Scott, I think his films are so different from Ridley's. And yet I think both of them have the same kind of impression to me in that they can be very hit and miss. They, but um, at least both filmmakers, though, uh i can admire what kind of swings they're taking even if i don't enjoy the actual film if that makes any sense even though they make very very different kinds of movies you know really scott goes much more big budget he goes into fantasy and historical epics and sci-fi and tony scott's way much more uh gritty and grounded and his films seem seem to be more um like like american domestic focused Right. And so I think it makes it so that uh, they're two very different kinds of filmographies. I think just because of the sense of scope and because not many filmmakers can know how to uh, handle that scope, I think I still lean Ridley. Mm -hmm. Um, Even even if his batting average in the later years have not been great, there's still a sense of I want to see what he's got this time. Sort of like an M. Night Shyamalan kind of thing. It's like, it's like, all right, if you whiff, better luck next time. I'll, I'll see your next movie. I appreciate the effort. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the effort. You know, Not um, many people would take a swing like that. Yeah. What I love about Tony Scott is I love his handling of like uh, frantic energy and adrenaline in his movies. What I don't really care for is the so at times really horrible color correcting that shows how early 2000s they could be mm. you know back when they look very <laughs> Jay, overexposed Jay, Jay, is giving you, Jay is giving you a look with daggers i've never seen this before on the show he's like what the hell did you just say it was anyway continue kevin i've never seen that before but anyway. <laughs> I, I, there's this may be this may be just me i don't know there's like there's a certain kind of look in a movie that involves high saturation and high exposure that just it really irritates my eyes it's something that Zack snyder is super guilty of doing and every once in a while uh, a Tony Scott movie. I see. I see it playing on TV. I look at it and I go, "Oh, what is this color or this this hue? Did, did they put like three Instagram filters over it or, or something like that?" But it's just a it's it's a minor thing. I think I think when you when when Tony Scott really nails uh, the how the action drives the story and drives the character, I think his films are excellent, and he knows how to like make the most out of. A simple premise which is why I, I wanted to be on this episode for unstoppable because i think unstoppable <laughs> is such a great example of taking a simple premise and just like executing it and like delivering in every yeah. aspect of it yeah. i made unstoppable when i was six years old with the train set in my playroom you, you made know? it go choo-choo yeah i made it go choo-choo and it was on it was it was a runaway train well, you know, who, you know who else my, made it. You know, I imagined, of course, that uh, I was the conductor and my engineer. Uh, his wife died of cancer, and oh. and it was uh, I was a very mature six year old. Jay, I got I got to ask you. So the real par- sense of storytelling. So did so your parents gave you like the choo choo set and like you got like a camera and you filmed it over and over again. And, oh, yeah, Fableman and, style. And, uh, yeah, Fableman style. And then like Did you, you ever know, do that when you were really young, make a movie. 
like make, make a movie a, like record that. A, yeah, I made a I made a Lego movie, and I I honestly think I have a case against. You think it better than I, Lord and Miller? I think I at least have a case against them. I think I inspired them. I, I think you could call it copycat. I mean, but, you do kind of have a Will Ferrell face. It that was sort fair. of a. It was sort of a kind of James Bond style Lego oh. film that we recorded. License to build. It was a masterpiece some mm-hmm. have said but <laughs> unfortunately it has been lost oh it's like oh it's we're a... waiting for the criterion restoration so you were oh i was gonna say well do you have the footage or is it lost like the 40 we, we gotta find it we oh so it's it. like the hour of, of footage that they lost for cruising when we talked yeah about it's sort of the um the ambersons of its uh of its oh time. okay My that's probably ambersons that's probably time. a more appropriate comparison yeah. than then it's like i don't think we'll ever get the full film but, but you can kind of some piece it some together jay ledbetter experts can probably okay. piece together the vision i'm sure the the two people that uh are interested in that are gonna be at your doorstep here i think you're overstating that <laughs> um no i think that like like uh well kevin picked really so that means it's kind of even it feels like, like we got. I think it's seven I, to five. I think it's I seven five. Tony, no. Uh, yeah, seven five. Tony. Tony, yeah, for sure. But the the Ridley's came up big in the back half of the episodes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I get it. I mean, guy made Alien and Blade during Rock. the episodes for some of his best movies. They were like, eh. yeah. <laughs> I remember when we did that series, and we're like, we're just gonna skip over a couple uh here we're just not going to talk about those and uh for mostly this series we've talked about like what how many we've done like 12 of the 16 16 right? yeah mm-hmm. that's pretty good right we skipped revenge beverly hills cop taking of pelham one two three and the fan yes yeah and um we'll have some thoughts probably real quickly on those at the end of the episode when we do the rankings but guys before we get into talking about unstoppable jay we actually do have to cover a film that was in between yeah. last week's episode choo-choo deja, deja vu and unstoppable yeah another choo-choo movie yeah taking a pillow one two three um, yeah i like this movie a lot of people you hate do this movie. i you- i like this movie and it is largely i think your opinion of the film hinges on the travolta performance i was just gonna and say i think it's the travolta totally travolta is yeah. awesome and it is sort of the the start of kind of elder statesman not superhero denzel in the tony scott filmography you don't think Obviously, he's not a superhero two. in that movie uh no he's a guy sitting at a desk who has committed intense fraud anyone could um, be a, a hero that's pretty rude that's true that's the yeah. whole point of uh, taking pillow up telling one two three yep but it uh i i think this movie gets an unfair shake a little bit because it is called the taking of pillow one two three and the mm. original taking of pillow one two three is incredible it's a five out of five film yeah it's amazing and i think it's really hard to remake a movie that is truly truly great so i i think that is held against it slightly unfairly if it was called subway uh, murder man e, e fresh which would be a great title mm-hmm. okay uh subway murder man <laughs> subway I murder think, man. subway murder be, man you know a lot of people would put it in like that three and a half star range which is where i have it i think it's still a very well-made film it again sort of tone tones down that 2000 style that kevin hates and i think is one of the <laughs> most interesting filmmaking techniques of uh the last 40 years but um, I, I think that movie is a lot of fun and it is sort of a throwaway in some ways. It's a little bit of a gun for hire type of deal. Yeah. But I have a lot of fun with it. I just do. I just do. I think I agree with you. Um, I, I, I haven't, I haven't squeezed. I didn't get to squeeze it in before we did the show. Um, so I, I missed the train. Yeah. I watched one. it again. I, oh, did you watch it again? Mm-hmm. Jesus. Christ. Okay. Um, you got a lot of time on your hands, uh, it seems like, uh, to watch. I don't know, Ryan. You've been putting in the movies lately. You've been Listen, logging. I have been logging. You've been, been logging. And you must be Messina? If I'm logging, you're Messina? No? 
Okay, anyway. Um, did, you, <laughs> did you try to put that together in your head? Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to. I feel like Denzel trying to solve the taking of home one, two, three. I felt like you're a little deja vu face right there. Uh, anyway, um, I just remember it being fine. And I remember it being not as memorable as obviously the movie we're going to talk about today or even deja vu when I saw it in the theater. And it's on. it was one that was on TNT or FX a lot. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just remember not being like, I thought Travolta was weirdly miscast. And so I do need to give it a rego. Spoiler alert, it is lower on my tier than, than, you know, probably Jay's is, but it's, I don't, you no, know, but the, I, but I don't think is, it's, a, again, I don't think it's a trash, trash movie. I just am not a fan of, of Travolta. And that no, I the just, difference uh, between me and Kevin is I think Tony Scott has never made a bad movie. Yeah. So, I mean, like, uh, I don't yeah. know if and I don't know if it's taking one, two, three. So it's lower on my list, but yeah. it's, you know, on a, on a curve. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it would be on a curve cause it's trains go choo choo. Um, but sure. speaking of curves, unstoppable, but also I should know <laughs> unstoppable would not exist if not for taking. Home yeah. I feel like that movie is, that's the other thing about it is a man you, loved trains. You kind of have to give taking a Pelham one, two, three, a pass so that you can get the confidence from the studio to give you 85 to a hundred million dollars to make unstoppable. So no, I mean, taking a Pelham one, two, three was not a hit, but I'm no, I'm, no, I'm no, telling no, no, you. But, Tony Scott started loving train. No, I'm, I, I understand that Jay. And that's what, but it also, it's like, you have to make that movie in order to get to here. So it's a, it's a walk to run situation or a walk or a crawl to walk. Does that make sense? That's probably right. Okay. So, um, but now we're here to talk about unstoppable. Yeah. Which is sadly the well, last Kevin, You got film. any thoughts on taking film? Yeah. Do you got any thoughts? Take? Have you seen it? Nope, I have not. Good for you. You seen the uh, <laughs> you seen the Mathau? Have you seen the the Walter Mathau one? You mean the original one? Yeah, that's that's one of my blind spots. Oh, it's mm. a big spot. It's blind great. Spot. Yeah, Kino uh, Lorber 4K. Get it? Great film. It's a great film. Mm. I bought the Kino Lorber Blu-ray and then you, yeah, came Dodo out. Bird. What are you doing? They came out before. I didn't know they were. Double I dip. 4K. I don't know that I'm, that might be a later double dip. That's you know what that is. That's a I mean, double a dip when film. it's like a when it's like fifty or sixty percent off, and you can double. Exactly. Yeah, that's a sale double dip. That's a do. sale double dip. No, 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 for sure. Well, no, there's a sale going on at the time of this recording. You can double oh, dip. God, Ryan, don't sorry. Tell me that. I'm sorry. I know you're like, a, hey, we only enable each other to not have any money in our bank accounts. You do this I with know. posters, and I do this with with uh, physical media it's terrible yeah i mean i got plenty of physical media not like you but uh oh, I, to, I, I gotta stop yeah i have i have completely somebody's gonna abstain from this criterion sale, i need like a I'm conservatorship of. over my uh over my uh bank accounts at yeah you're kind of the britney songs. spears of <laughs> don't, 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 don't say that jesus christ um i knew you were gonna say it i shouldn't have even brought up the comparison why did you do that um no i just no, actually, I've I've been really good. I haven't bought anything on the Criterion sale yet. I'm just waiting mm. to see what I because uh, I'm you know I I get a little I get Criterions that I have to write about every single month and uh, and uh, you know I'm just waiting to see what I get so then I don't know double buy. Does that mm. make sense? I don't want to double buy. Um, but uh, Kevin, unstoppable. You picked this one. It's a big one. It's one of those movies that came out in 2010. That I, I, I've got some. I've got a story behind it, and um, sorry out there to everyone I went to college with. Um, but um, I got. I got to know your feelings about it because I feel like you saw this when you were in college or about to go to college. Maybe you're in high school. Um, in yeah, the I was in high time. school. When I feel like this out. is this is the one. I know that I've had theater experiences. Jay didn't really, but this is the one we've all seen in theaters, right? Jay, you see, still seen it? In, you saw this in theaters? No, didn't see it in God theaters. God damn it, Jay. I did not either. God damn it, guys. All right. Well, no one's got a theater-going experience for this movie that should be seen on yeah. every big screen possible. First couple um, years of college movies were 17th priority. I don't want to know the list of 16. No, that's you don't da- want to. That's, that's dangerous. Um, no. Your child's going to listen to this one day. Um, I but, didn't go into any details. Yeah, that's true. Um, maybe, you know what? Maybe release Could one. Chocolates. Chocolate? 
There's chocolate and there's chocolate. Chocolate. Did you put it that chocolate in your pocket? In my pocket. Oh, I did. I did. All right. Okay. Kevin, what are your thoughts on Unstoppable as a movie? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I mean, there's a reason why I chose to guest on this one. Um, Unstoppable to me is one of those movies where you're like flipping the TV channel, seeing what movies are playing on, on, on cable. And you, you find out one of them is playing Unstoppable and, I'm, and you're like, oh, well, I, I know what my next two hours is going to be. Like, I'm, I'm set. There's a, there's a few movies in my uh, in my opinion that are like that. Um, the Mummy with Brandon Fraser is another really good example where I can I can watch that movie over and over and over again. Unstoppable to me is like just pure popcorn blockbuster entertainment. It's so relentlessly paced for a 98 minute movie. It's so well structured, and the characters I think there's just enough writing and development work done on them to make you root for them and, and care about them succeeding in helping people get out of this horrible, disastrous situation. It also helps that the characters we're following, at least most of the characters that we're following, like the leads, are people who are good at their jobs. And I think that's a subgenre that I love, just movies that involve characters who are good at their jobs. We, we love it. Um, Seeing it again recently, I, I literally just watched this movie again today in preparation of this episode. Man, this movie came out in 2010, and yet I feel like this movie has only gotten better and more relevant today. Um, seeing it this time, I picked up very clearly on our characters being um, blue collar workers. Um, that the tension between Denzel's character and Chris Pine's character in the beginning has a sense of not only just generational divide, but there's a talk about privilege that I think is very fascinating. Chris Pine's a Nepo baby in this movie. We need to yeah. talk about it. Ooh, yeah. Boy. And then um, there's also the idea of how in the beginning of the film, the, the way they come up with ideas to help stop this train are largely determined by people in offices and the people who actually pay the consequences with their lives are the working people. And so even though the plot is about this runaway train, it's very much still about like this dynamic of, of the workforce. It's, it's kind of like how um, Jaws may be about a shark, but if, if you really are watching that movie, you very well know like the mayor is such a uh, character that needs to be talked about in, in that story. So seeing it again, like I feel like it's got just enough depth and uh, political substance in there that could be talked about if you want to talk about it. And for those who just want to have a really good time, just want a shot of adrenaline and dopamine, this movie just has it. And so it just satisfies like both types of audiences in, in such a great way. Meanwhile, I think Denzel and, and Chris Pine, they're great in this movie. I think they have terrific chemistry. And we have to remember, this is a Chris Pine who just got off of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek reboot. So he's so he, I mean, he's like a rising star, but he's not like dominant top action star that that every move, everyone from every studio wants him in yet, you know? And like, he, he just like fits in perfectly here. I, I think it's such a smart decision. I, I'm a bit sad that we haven't gotten more movies with Chris Pine and Denzel together because I think they're so good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's 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 uh, that's how I feel about it uh, overall. J Dog, thoughts on Unstoppable? J Dog, you are muted. Yeah, we got to talk Unstoppable. We got to talk uh, a little background, but I mm -hmm. I really think if you want to talk about what I think of this movie, I think Soul Asylum really said it best. You know. Runaway train, never going back. Wrong way on a one way track. And that's really what the movie is about. <laughs> and, you know, earlier today we were talking about how this podcast needs more singing. Jesus. And you really, you, re I knew that was going to, we were in a, our text threads today and 
Yeah, I mean, that was brought up, and I, and I uh, think that's going to be kind of a staple of the program. So, all right, here we go. We'll, uh, we'll certainly. I can't wait for the next series a song, when you're. A song a week. Yeah, I, a no. song a week. I can't wait to see how you tie some of the movies that we do to a song a week. Yeah, that'll be really interesting, right? We'll, we'll really have to yeah. work pretty hard there. Might be so, inappropriate at some times, but we'll no, see. No, never. It'll be perfect. So, I'll tell you what I didn't really realize about this film. It's pretty much based on a true story. Didn't know that. I, mm-hmm. I did not know that. Uh, so in May of 2001. Denzel did this. I'm just kidding. Yeah, Denzel did this oh, for real. Not that. No, in uh, May of 2001, this almost to the T happened in Ohio. Le- less dramatic, but um, truly, you know, the one thing in this film that I'm like, okay, how exactly did that happen? Is the throttle going up in the train, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're like, okay, how exactly did that happen? Well, that's exactly what happened. So the engineer. Who I pushed think, it? either remotely or otherwise sort of applied the throttle. But when you're at the station and you have the air brakes, applying the throttle will actually slow it down. But Mm. he didn't realize that the air brakes were disconnected, which they usually are in the station. And so he basically did exactly what Ethan Supley does in this film, where he hopped out of the train because he saw that the, um, you know, the changer or whatever you call it. I don't know. Whatever. Can I is. can I just say not to cut you off, Jay? Yeah, no, no, cut but, me off. Okay, not to. I'm not trying to be. Goddamn you. Um, is the 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 thesis of this movie is essentially don't not listen to T.J. Miller and stay in the goddamn car because if he just did, we wouldn't had this problem. It's really a weird juxtaposition since uh, T.J. Miller is a terrible person, but um, yeah. It's it, it it seems like a, like a, almost like in the movie Jay, uh, like almost like a ghost pushes it forward. Like Tony Scott's like, I need this movie to start, so they just but <laughs> just apparently push it from forward. a technical perspective, it is a real thing. Right? So yeah, I can't really argue against it. I still don't really know how it works. Well, I can feel they like did their research. I can feel like that when you're putting something kind of when you're not fully securing right or stopping it. Things are in motion. Maybe no, I think it was done happens. purposefully. Yeah. Oh, somehow. okay. Somehow. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it did the opposite of what it was supposed to do because the air brakes were disconnected, which yeah. they are when they're at the station. Yeah. And the train was carrying molten fennel. The, they tried that derailing device that they actually try in the film. Yeah, that's just so this was like a real thing. Yeah. It wasn't as dramatic. The ending wasn't as dramatic as this film. There weren't, you know, it wasn't quite as action packed as, as the movie itself, but uh, they had these two guys in the train, a rookie conductor and kind of an old school engineer who connected the train, connected to the train. And they did, you know, like the alternating brake and um, propulsion thing. And it worked. They slowed it down to 11 miles an hour and some guy ran onto it. So it wasn't exactly the jumping oh. off of a pickup truck onto it, but it was, you yeah. know, a very similar thing. And so they wrote a script for this film and, you know, who they originally wanted to direct it hot director at the time Hmm. martin campbell this is coming off a casino royale he was fully on board to direct this it's actually not a bad choice if you're not not gonna have tony scott do this because martin campbell is a pretty good i wouldn't say great but he's a pretty good action director i agree and casino royale rules and so, he did Mask of Zorro, and that movie rules. And he did. He did. He did Golden Eye. He, he did rebooted Golden Bond Eye. twice. Yeah. Yeah. Golden Eye. Well, yeah. You know, Golden Eye is okay. It's not but, great, but, but uh, Casino you know Royale happened, rules. Yes. You know what happened when Martin Campbell was developing this movie? Hmm. The Great Recession occurred. And oh yeah. There were right. some budgetary concerns, and it sort <laughs> of think? stagnated. Yeah. <laughs> And Campbell left to direct uh, Edge of Darkness, that Mel Gibson movie. Remember that one? Yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's a pretty I, good I movie. Like it. Yeah, it's no, get the gringo, but uh, no, what is no, get the gringo, but it's no, it's uh, Ray Winston's really good in that movie too. With, with yeah, Mel, yeah, I think that's a know. pretty, pretty solid movie. But yeah. eventually, Tony Scott somehow gets his hands on the script and he's like, I, I love trains, like, trains are so cool. Martin and Campbell so series, he, by uh, the way. Uh, no, absolutely. Okay. Not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he gets Denzel on board immediately. But what happens is Tony Scott, look, they're, they're again, they're still kind of in the recession. They're really concerned about paying talent. And mm. so they say Tony Scott, his quote at the time, six million bucks. 
They say, Tony, take $3 million. Tony is just like, okay, fine, I'll do it. I really want to make this movie. <laughs> they say, Denzel, take $4 million. And Denzel is like, get out of here. No, thank you. <laughs> I can, so just, Denzel, I can just see him Denzel, be like, hell no. Denzel leaves the project. He he leaves the project. Uh, wow. They had Pine was sort of in this interesting place because this was right after Star Trek. And so mm. he was could sort of make whatever he wanted. And he really wanted to make this movie. So he's well, in. He did like well, Denzel, most of his stunts in this. Well, Denzel kind of pushed for him a little bit too, didn't he? From what I read. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, Denzel wanted him on. and then But then Denzel leaves the project for all of nine days. <laughs> because box kind of gives gives in and they're like okay we'll pay you fine. it's denzel washington i, I mean this movie had a hundred million dollar budget this is an expensive movie it, this movie did not make its money back either like it is it, no if you account for the marketing and stuff probably i don't think anybody was pissed off about this movie but nobody was they weren't popping champagne over it either. no the, no because they probably like what is it that apple cider that's what they were they probably, were probably yeah they could only afford the grape juice yeah exactly the welches but, yeah but as they're developing the movie tony scott is like let's tweak this script a little bit i want to set it in the american west is what he wants to do which is an interesting take and he comes to the realization eventually that you know what's interesting about the american west is it's wide open and if it crashes who cares so the <laughs> the, the tension of the film is kind of deflated um so what you're saying is is he wanted to kind of do his own horizon maybe yeah uh, maybe okay. he wanted to make this a four-part train movie oh man that would could you imagine if we had a four-part train movie set three hours a piece and I every can. section sounds... every section of the train is an hour of a different storyline <laughs> honestly i'd pay money to see it no, but you know make it a mini series movie that each is segment's a season eight minutes yeah. long yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's to its credit very much. But yes, obviously, the practical effects of this film are incredible. <laughs> practical effects can be expensive. Again, this movie cost $100 million. He gets these two helicopters. One of them he calls the story ship, and one of them he calls the camera ship. Uh, one because it's actually in the story, and the other one is, you know, for, for filming. And it's a moderate success, might be generous. Yeah, I think that's uh, not generous. a not a massive hit. And that's sort of the story of Unstoppable. And it rules. Critics adored this movie. It is probably his most celebrated film since Crimson Tide, critically. Probably. It was a yeah. it was a big deal. And everybody was sort of it's everybody was coming to the realization that late Tony Scott rocks. This was a little bit of critics turning the corner on the Tony Scott experience. People started getting on uh, that RT. Yes. They, they started getting on the seven, seven, seven. And they were like, this guy, his talent That's... is as big as the Chrysler building. And he's going to go choo choo all the way yeah. for 98 minutes. And I do, I, I, I love this movie. I, I think it is kind of elevated a little bit, even by the fact that it is Tony Scott's last film. I think that matters. And it plays in, in the movie itself. Sort of like the taking of Pelham 123, it is Denzel moving on to this elder statesman period of his career a little bit where he's not the badass. He's the uh, older guy with an incredible amount of knowledge who you just have has this integrity to him, this incredible integrity to him. And the one thing that I think this film sells as well as any movie of its ilk, when they start doing the melodramatic speeches to each other in the train, I buy it so hard mm -hmm. when they're talking about the dead wife and the restraining order and, and all that stuff. I feel it because the situation is so heightened. It's like talking to a stranger at a bar almost where you're just like, there are no implications to me talking to you about this. So let's just talk about it. And the performances are so good that it, it plays so well the epitome of what makes this movie awesome is the scene where the train runs into the horse trailer and you're just like, Oh my God, how did somebody not go to the hospital from the scene or the train derailment, which is yeah. a real train derailment. They just derailed yeah. that train and had a big explosion occur during it in the same way that, you know, during deja vu, they blew up a freaking ferry and yeah. that stuff matters. At least to a certain generation of, of, of moviegoers. Kevin, last week during our Deja Vu episode, I was kind of questioning, do you, 
people born after 2000 care about practical effects like that? Does it matter to them? And I really am curious about that, but certainly the critical contingent of today, the people that grew up with the films of the nineties and, you know, maybe these, these uh, late Tony Scott films, for instance, it really does matter because I think it gives it such a sense of groundedness and realism and has such an impact on how much these movies impact you because it does give you the sense of danger that a lot of movies today don't give you. I, I think it's a great film. I think it is kind of one of the great final films in a career, which can be bad. And it, we'll talk later about what might have been with Tony Scott's next film or next films. Obviously it's tragic that this was his last film, but historically, as far as his legacy is concerned, it's one of his most celebrated films and it's his last one, which I hate, but it's a, it's a great note to go out on if, if you're going to go out. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jay, when you watch this movie and you finish it and Kevin probably felt this too, you're like, okay, what's the next Tony Scott movie I'm going to watch? And you realize it's it. And um, I'm not going to say I'm going to get really emotional here, but like it, it, this, this hurts. I because, got genuinely emotional when I was reading about yeah you know his passing and what he was planning and, and how and enthusiastic he seemed to be about all all it of seemed the stuff like that he it done. seemed like we were taken of four or five more really interesting masterpieces and and or just great films in general and the thing about Tony Scott that I've noticed in doing this series with you Jay talking with all of our great guests is his adaptability to whatever is going on, but also his ability to be ahead of the curve as well. And no pun intended. An understanding of great actors, man. Yeah. And I he think that that's for talent. He did. And he, I think he would have been able to get like, cause obviously this movie wasn't a success. Deja vu is moderately a success. Deja vu was a success. I think sort of, I think it was unmitigated <laughs> success. Yeah. Um, Pelham wasn't, but, no. but yet he was able to get a movie star like Denzel Washington, Tom Cruise, Hackman, you know, these, these, these names in cinema to buy into what Will he was Smith. selling. Will Smith. Um, and he was able to put pretty effective films together and work within the studio system to create something special. What do you mean pretty effective films? Incredible <laughs> films, my friend. I'm just you and trying. Kevin are just underselling the hell out of Tony Scott. I can't believe I'm, not, I'm having to defend Tony I'm Scott not, on the last hey. episode of our Tony Scott series. Hey. And he just walked out of the room. He's so angry. You're getting right me now. worked up. There you go. Um, I, I'm going to miss talking about him. And I, because when I watched this movie and when I saw it in the theaters, since I was the only one who saw it in the theaters, Jay. Um, yeah, and you came out of it and you were like, that was pretty effective. No, and I was like, this movie freaking rules. It and is. I don't know why people aren't talking about it because no one was. It was one of those where, yeah, I'm just going to say it's time has passed. I got my diploma. I skipped uh, class one day and I was just like, I want to go see a Excuse movie. Excuse me. You heard me. I skipped class. And I went and saw Unstoppable because I was like, what's playing? And I was like, Unstoppable is playing. I'm like, oh, I like Denzel. And I like Tony Scott. All right, I'm going to go check that out. And I was blown away by it. I was blown away because it's like, it's everything you want in a Tony Scott action movie. And it goes back to what we were talking about with Man on Fire. Then it, it sneakily adds these human character moments into it that elevates it to another level. And it's 98 minutes. It's as quick as that train on the track. It never stops. And yet the only time it does temporarily stop is when they are driving backwards to go get the train. And I was super affected by that pine and his insecurities as a person and having to reckon with the fact that this is not a perfect human that is going to do uh, this act. He is very flawed. A very flawed character and yet you're rooting that hopefully like after doing something like this things can get better denzel 
I mean, has probably one of the great Denzel moments in all of his filmography where he reveal the revealing that he's been canned after and he's got two weeks left. And he's so like, good. I'm it's not like doing revealing I'm not- that Bruce Willis is dead. It is exactly. so good. It's it's I mean, his line delivery of I'm not doing it for you. Not doing it for you. It's it's incredible. And that's what happens when you have a career relationship with the greatest actor of all time is you're able to get a movie like this to be elevated to such an extent yeah. that it, it shouldn't work. And I agree with you, Jay. I think you brought up an amazing point and probably why I'm frustrated with so much critical analysis today from contemporaries is a movie like this, you, me, Kevin, our friends and people that have been on the show, we love this movie because this is one of the few films left from the 2010s and beyond. And why I think also we hold a movie like Mad Max Fury Road in such high esteem because that practical effect, yeah, it's it makes magic this on is the post screen. Iron Man. Yeah, this is post MCU. This is the year of the Avengers, if I'm not mistaken. Or no, no, it's no that's in two years. Iron Man two. Iron, Iron Man, Man two, two year. Yeah. Thor year. But we're right at the beginning of phase one of the MCU. Yeah. We're right at yeah. the beginning of the DCU. We're right in the shifting the shifting yeah. tide of CGI Cinematic environment dominating yeah. everything. And here's Tony Scott saying, you know what's great? A uh, hundred minute movie, two guys on a train trying to stop it. I grew up watching those movies. You grew up watching those movies. What if we made one of those? We put Denzel Washington in it. We put a, 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 a young star on the rise in Chris Pine. And we just said, let's make it about these two people on a train. And let's see if it works. And it does. This is a, this is a really special movie. I agree with you, Jay. I think it gets a little bump because it is his last film. But also, it's a damn good movie and doesn't need that bump anyway. It's just like a four and a half. It rocks in and Close itself. to five star movie. I agree with Kevin. I can watch this movie if I had to every week, the rest of my life. And I would be okay with that. This is his second shortest movie. Yeah. What's his shortest? Is it the uh, hunger. what the hunger, the hunger? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's his first, first one. It almost, it's, first it's and, almost like doesn't count. Yeah. Well, his first and his, and his last one, it's yeah. real mirrors of one another, but, um, but yeah, I think I, I love this movie. And, um, the other unsung hero of this movie is Rosario Dawson. She's great. Who I think is absolutely fantastic and adds that mm-hmm. other level of the sort of corporate bureaucracy, the fight inside the, you know, the control room. And that's the part, right? That's the Pelham one, two, three versus the train kind of stuff. And, and, and it's, it's what weirdly doesn't work in the template in one, two, three in his remake. It works here because you're, yeah able to spend i think more time understanding the these two guys stuff i think nobody is what yeah. works so much better in this. the corporate guys are the bad guys not travolta the you know what I mean? scene where they call the ceo on the golf course <laughs> and he is just like how is it going to affect the share price and then he's like all right i'm trying to two putt here click <laughs> it is so good it's so trite but in this satisfying way that is just so Tony Scott. And again, he sort of dips his toe into the lowbrow stuff, them cutting back to the Hooters. The Hooters girls and they're all like dancing. Yeah. Like watching the America. News at Hooters. You know? it's, so, it's so good. And I think the uh, the daughters, I think, are really good in this movie. Denzel's but, daughters. But Dawson's Dawson's great because she's just oh, Dawson's like. Dawson's amazing. When the, when the, the brakes she don't. She has such character. Yeah, but she, the brakes. really principled person. Yeah. Well, when the brakes don't work, you just, I love it because. She's saying exactly what we're saying. It's like, Galvin, you asshole. Like, you know, this is me saving your ass. Yeah. And that, and it's like, yes, exactly. Just like, who gives a shit at this point? So Stop this train. Sort of what Denzel probably should have been a little bit more of in Pelham? taking a Pelham one. Yeah, exactly. She should be a little bit more forceful again rule breaker that's actually you know I mean? taking a Pelham one, two, three is a very weird Denzel performance. It really is. He's very from what subdued. I remember, he's very subdued and passive. And he's a not bit. very confident. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, it's interesting. T- like timid 
until yeah. like the and end. He can pull right? that off, and I think he does pull it off, but it's not. Yeah. It's certainly not one of my favorite Denzel performances. No, it's just like it's like he's awesome and unstoppable. It feels like they're trying to find the formula to get to this. You know what I mean? Yeah, in this movie, he's kind of over it, but also has knows that he knows better than these other people. Oh man! But he's also just tired. When Pine's on the knows that he's near the end of his rope. When Pine's on the phone, and uh, and he's just like, "Will get off the phone." Well, yeah. I would be I would be scared if I was Pine at that point. I would be just straight well, up. Well, that's well, that's the thing. Like the the first half of this movie, what's what's really amazing is like I've seen this movie so many times, yeah. and it's really cool to see how the first thirty or so minutes, Denzel and Chris Pine's character don't even know about the runaway train yet. No, it's, they're they're just they're just you know working a shift together. And that's a third of the movie, right? It, yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a third of the movie exactly. But like during the third, you have like you have like scenes like Denzel telling Chris Pine get off the phone. There's also Denzel asking him like why why are we carrying five extra cars behind us, right? Mm-hmm. Where he's like on his back all the time, right? But even then, the the script sets up this tension like instantly in the beginning. Like Chris Pine's character comes in, he's like I'm looking for this guy, and he gets introduced to Denzel. Denzel's colleagues are already eyeing at him with. You know, and he's like, is there a problem? It's like, no, it's just, I don't like working at a daycare center. And Chris Pine goes, well, I don't like working at a retirement home. Yeah, and like you, right. you already, not only is there already tension, but there's also a sense of like, what's this guy's problem? Like what, what is, why does Chris Pine's character have this attitude? Right. And you re- and then you realize as the film progresses, like, oh, it's cause like he, he fucked up and like, he, he doesn't see himself as like, a good person or like he's trying he's trying to fix things but you but he he oh, knows he's self-loathing for he, sure yeah he's self-loathing and yeah. he knows he's got like the short temper and denzel can see it too and there's a but there's but denzel captures that balance of like there is a part of him who is irritated and annoyed that like you young people are replacing us but he still but you but denzel still has that like gentle mentorship kind of mm-hmm. vibe like he still wants to teach him though. So like the, the scenes, the early scenes where they're arguing with one another, like the part where, like when Chris Pine's like, well, you know what? This is my train. I'm the conductor. Denzel doesn't even fight back on it. He's like, that's true. Yeah, that, that's true. And well, Chris he, Pine he, does end up being pretty good. He's like, you're the best line in the movie. Is, it is your train. Guy. Guy. Yeah, this you're is funny guy. Coulson, your conductor letting you know we're running this bitch down. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like pumping your fist on the couch. Let's and then go, go. well, I don't think you know what you're doing. Coulson. You know, like like it's like it's like he knows that he's like you're you're only here because you're you know what is it your dad or something right, right, part right, of the right. company and yet you're gonna be a you know prick to us like you know it, it, it's again right. like i go back to you kevin it's about people finding i think the gumption to do the right thing as well as also you know he's looking for a bit of redemption from his past as well as denzel is teaching him and trying to get him to understand like this isn't just some passing job like it's a serious thing if you take it seriously you could be probably pretty good at it and then once he finally sort of like they get to know each other believe in one another there becomes this bond that the two of them have and then in that last third they are there for each other and that is when this movie Mm -hmm fucking slaps so hard it's such a it's such a great transition too because like yeah. i think i think the midpoint of the film like halfway in the film is when denzel and chris pine's character decide we're going after that train that's like yeah. halfway into the movie and but even at that point when they decide to go after that train they still weren't really on the same page together emotionally you can see it on chris pine's face like He's only doing it because that there's a high chance that that train's going to reach um, Stanton, the t- his, where he's from. He's like, so there's like a bit of like, all right, I have, I have to, I'm obligated to like, I, but there's a hesi- hesitancy there, unlike Denzel's character. And then it starts to change once they, um, once they talk to like the, the VP, the uh, Kevin Dunn's character. Oh, he's and, so good. and then Chris Pine learns about Denzel's character being fired and they don't even need to talk about that anymore. There's already a new level of understanding between them. Mm-hmm. And so that's what triggers 
Chris Pine's character now being willing to open up about what's going on with him and his wife over to Denzel. And you, again, the, that father figure mentorship and Denzel comes out the way he just tells Chris Pine's character to call your wife. Yeah. But she has her day off. She's probably sleeping. Don't make excuses. Like you quit, you quit too early. Like, don't you understand how these things work? You got to call her. (laughs) It is. There is. It's great. There's this guru mentality that Denzel kind of has this spiritual nature to him where he's like, look, I've experienced the greatest loss you can imagine. I don't want you to have to do that. Have no regrets. Reach out to this person that you love. I know you made a mistake, but you can still redeem yourself and it's powerful and it's Denzel. So you buy it wholeheartedly. And then then when they are finally together, like, like what Ryan's talking about in the third act, I love that line that Denzel says where they, they now have developed this friendship. And then Denzel's like, I got to go do this thing. And he says, Hey, don't look at me like that. makes me feel like I'm going to (laughs) die. (laughs) <laughs> i love yeah, that yeah, yeah that, that's awesome i mean jay in a lot of ways when i've watched this now Don't obviously so nostalgic it's it's different now than like when we watch other films in general but it's kind of weirdly feels like a semi baton passing moment as well too like it oh, feels kind of i mean it Pine does kind of feel like den- no no he's, he's not, not the next den- so. no but it's like but denzel's the one championing him to make this movie I'm sure part of him coming back is still wanting to work with Pine and obviously working with Tony. They have incredible chemistry together. Pine is notorious for this in just being one of the best, or I think right now, plug and pull. You put him in a movie like a movie like Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. should not be, I think, as good as it is. Um, and it's partly to do because of Pine. He has so every movie he's kind of in for the most part. He his performance elevates these parts that should not be as good. Like he's really good in the Wonder Woman movie. He's really good mm-hmm. in that ensemble and in, in like a movie like um oh god, what was it? He's, he's really the good best in, thing into, the in, into the woods. I was yeah, just gonna exactly. say into the woods. Into like the woods. he has versatility. He like if he's given the right roles yeah. and, and selects the right parts, like and I mean obviously he's fantastic in the Star Trek series. Um in in you know, not his fault of certain things are you know, in sequels, turn out certain ways. He's good yeah, as that yeah. character. He can so do. He has he can the do goods. Serious, serious drama you know? too. I, I don't know. I don't know what um, the two of you think of Hell or High Water, but I love that movie. Uh, yeah, I, I he's like, really I like good that in that movie. movie. Yeah, he's I, really good in that. My opinion of Pine, it, I I like Pine a lot. He can definitely be propulsive in the force of a film. He cannot be like the heliocentric this is my movie and my yeah. movie primarily. Um, he's never really proven that Star Trek. I still think is a big ensemble movie. He's yeah. awesome at the center of that movie, but it's not his movie. Right. No, but I think, I think he's just an excellent cog to put in different Agreed. Agreed. Th- vehicles. And Absolutely. I think that Denzel sees, I can make a really damn good movie with this guy and that's why i think you know denzel firmly made his case that chris pine is the best chris in uh in hollywood and he no, just had and he had the stake ahead hemsworth. of hemsworth i know right now hemsworth's got the mantle because man he's really good and furioso i just he's, think hemsworth chooses really interesting projects yeah like men in black international you know? uh, i mean oh he's made some bad stuff but um I, he's I think also worked he in some good he's good worked some good taste. some good movies too yeah. Where would you so how would you put it right now? What's the show's definitive ranking of, of I go Chris's? Hemsworth, Chris, Pine, Pine, Pratt, Evans. I'm an Evan. Like Evans has not made anything remotely interesting in a long time. Oh, but you would put so you put where you you, you only think it's those four? Who's the other one that I might Where are other ones? I mean, I would put Messina there. But that's just me oh, being an no, ass. That's, that's just me being that's an a, that's asshole. Contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to put Pratt in the. Is I that get that a potential. Listen, I star. get Pratt as a. I still a, like the Guardians movies a lot, and I think he's really good in them. Yeah, but he's not the reason why I like them. He's not the reason why I like the last one. I liked no, it because it was, he's good. It was dark. I mean, I don't like the Guardians movies because of Chris Pratt. I like him because of James Gunn's ability to build that world. Really good as Star Lord and Chris Evans has refused to make an interesting movie since knives out well i mean that's fair that's fair though he is going to though he is going to be in celine song's next film 
that's that could yeah, be which very, maybe that'll turn it around. But oh, I think Evans that really, I think that that will be pretty. Good. I thought Evans was really going to start doing some interesting stuff when he was in, you know, Bong, Bong, he was working with Bong Joon Ho, um, mm, and, and Morgan, then Ryan Johnson seemed to be kind of into some interesting stuff, and then he has just abandoned that completely. Well, I mean, like, what is he just? He's just into like what the two things, right? Ghosted, ghosted, which is not good. And he I can understand the Netflix drug movie, which was a. Which one was that? Oh, the pain hustlers. Yep. Thing. Yeah. Bad. Which was the David Yates. Like I can understand wanting to work with Emily. Blunt. God, I forgot that was David Yates. Oh yeah. my God. And David then it's such a, oh, it's weird just, a just a weird dude. And then it, well, he also did um, the gray man, but that's working with his yeah, boys. That was, that was tough. Nobody got out of the gray man alive, even Gosling. Um, and so, yeah, I, no, I agree with you, but I, I do, I do think that when he is in interesting projects or stuff like that, I think he's really good. Oh, and light I, year, I, of course. Yeah, well, I he was in about. Don't Look. Who was he in Don't Look Up? Was he just himself? Apparently, he was in it. Oh, he oh, might he, have been himself. He's like a, they call it's like him a on cameo. The phone. Yeah, 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 it's like yeah, a cameo yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, but yeah, no, I put I would put Pine at two, two or one one B one A because Hemsworth, they're both really good. I, I I change back and forth. I mean, like, some, you know, Pine does a bad movie here, then I put Hemsworth up, but then, like, you know, Hemsworth does, a, you know, a Thor movie or whatever, and then you throw the other guy back up. But, like, man, Hemsworth in, in Furiosa. It's going to be really hard to take that off of my ballot. For I think I'm confusing Chris, Chris Evans' cameo in Free Guy with his cameo in Don't Look Up. I do not remember him in Don't Look Up. I don't remember either one of them, to be fair. He's in, They I call him on the phone in Free Guy. Oh, do they call him on the phone? Okay. One of the worst films of the last five years. I am so worried. By the time this airs, this movie's already going to be out, but I'm just really worried of how Deadpool is going to be. I feel like that it's going to be a nauseating experience. Like it we'll just, I, it's going to be so many shots. Well, it's Sean Levy as opposed to like. That's an auteur, man. That's. <laughs> and then I just, I'm just hearing about all the cameos and everything. It's like. If, why don't you just get John Watts and call it the next Spider-Man movie, for Christ's sake? Well, you should read the review on awardswatch.com written by film critic Jay Ledbetter. Yeah, but like you don't know what those thoughts are just at the time of recording. No, but I have, bet it'll be a great review. Either it will way. be a great review because you wrote it. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you one thing, and Kevin's going to probably laugh at me. There is one of the funniest goddamn things I've ever seen in a blockbuster in this movie. This movie is... 85 oh, let's hear it. Let's this hear movie it. is 85 to 100 million dollars and the thing that i can't get over of just i know tony scott he's so detailed in everything he does down to the fine tooth comb the scott brothers are like this but the photos on chris pine's phone and his wife's picture of him oh, this is an, this is on, an all-time flip phone movie uh, on their phones are the worst stock photos I've ever seen on phones from <laughs> characters in the history of movies. For the love of God, it's so lazy. It looked like they literally took photos of them from those scenes that they are in. Her photo, yeah, her hair's yeah, flowing yeah. in the wind. Yeah. They are ridiculous. Just take a regular goddamn photo of these people. Like, it's... No. It, take one with the kid or something like take, take one that's badly photoshopped where you can tell that they were not there on the same day <laughs> chris pine literally looks <laughs> like it's from his day job that he just started with Disney yeah, it yeah. he's got, you would be kidding yourself if you didn't think he's about to put on the fucking vest that he's going <laughs> in the trade with yeah. that's ridiculous yeah. i love that even in a hundred million and that's the other great thing jay about a movie like this it's a hundred million dollars you, it, the emotional scenes of these movies have her calling him and him calling her and you look at these flip phones and they're the most ridiculous things they don't take me out of it obviously but it's those little details that just they make movies like this special man we don't get like little shit like this anymore i feel like it's just the little flubs like this and they've kept them in because like Tony's are probably like fuck no, it, it's not even a flub it's just a it's just a a, a big oversight choice. it's a there's just a weird, weird choice. choice for for yeah. me there is a moment in this movie that makes me laugh every time it's it's near the end when when they successfully get the train to survive that curve 
and you can you can feel that the movie's almost over mm-hmm. by now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then Ned, the character Ned, My comes from. Dra- no, we haven't even talked comes, about Ned. We haven't talked from, about Ned, who is incredible. Lou Temple in this movie, which insane which, by performance. The, which, by the way, by the way, tangent. You know what I kept thinking about while while looking at Lou Temple? Mm-hmm. I kept thinking that's Glenn Powell in twenty years. Oh, uh, that's funny. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> He's got he's got Longmire energy written all over. <laughs> anyway, they're back, anyway they're the, the funny thing, the, the funny thing. The so Lou Temple's driving, yeah. and a Lou Temple, and a, he's got like these cops who are all driving behind him in support, right? And you get this close up of this one cop car driving across the train rail, and then flipping and crashing, and the car just rolls. And I'm like, <laughs> man, they screwed that up. <laughs> <laughs> that guy fucked up. One of the one of the funniest things to be about this movie is the around the rail they have built what apparently is like radiated plutonium. It's yeah. just like these silos of <laughs> like combustible material, uh, which just adds to these stakes uh, very artificially. But it's yeah, it's if you, good. If you it's good. don't shoot that little button or whatever, because if you do, you're gonna blow up all the kiddos. You know what I mean? Like it's like yeah. everybody's gonna die in this town. Um, no, my the other thing that always makes me laugh is at the end of this movie, everyone's celebrating or everything, and they they uh, Ethan uh, Supley is is like literally they are still with all the guys and he's celebrating and everything. I'm like, you would be locked up right now, you giant piece of shit. Well, they like, do that what weird are you thing doing again here? where they do the where are they now? For the oh my god, characters. the most savage where are you now ever? Yeah. Like he's working in the fast food industry. You're like, Jesus yeah. Christ. Like, I mean, fair, he's the asshole that caused all this, but like that's just like maybe a a, a detail not necessary, Tony, in this. It felt like it felt like the meanness of Domino. It'd be, it'd be funny if it'd be even funnier if Ethan Supley himself asked to put that in. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's one of those like, as a joke. Like, like I found this in, in my it. research. You know what I mean? Like it's no, I mean, like that's an insane thing to drop in this way. I love um, uh, what's his face, uh, Keith, uh, Corrigan. I love him as like the like the numbers guy because he, he's just like yeah I'm here for the field trip and then they just are like yeah we don't need you or want you here and then like shit starts hitting the fan and then he's just like okay bring him in we need the numbers guy and they're like yeah I'm pretty sure these numbers oh, yeah, are gonna the work nerd. yeah the yeah. nerd and they're like pretty sure these numbers are gonna work and they're like what's pretty sure and he's like I don't know maybe like a 50 50 chances I don't know I just added it up on a piece of paper here while I'm waiting to talk to these kids. You know, and and yet the numbers work. You know, it's like it's a it's a hunch. Denzel's like, oh, a hunch. I'm going oh. 70 miles an hour backwards, and he's giving me a hunch. It's better than nothing at this point. I mean, <laughs> God, this movie, this movie's so great because it is also super silly, and it doesn't. I don't feel like it. It's it's so entertaining, but again, it does have that human element to it. That yeah. is just the Tony Scott special. It's the thing it's, that makes him a. a all-time filmmaker in my it has the silliness but it's also it also nails the intensity like one of the other aspects of the movie that i love so much is the way the movie constantly cuts to news broadcasts and like the tv and like the journalists reporting on it Mm -hmm. sometimes you can feel that silliness in it where like you're you're kind of laughing like oh my god this this whole like town is like in a panic about this but at the same time the way they were reporting on it and the way the movie cuts back and forth between the reporting and our characters it really does create this intense feeling of like you're watching this unfold in the present tense. Like you really are watching this mm-hmm. happen live on live television, you know? So it, it does have that uh, intensity to it. The other little detail I love so much is every time you see the, the runaway train like speeding or hitting something, there's like, Tony Scott puts the same sound effect where like the train kind of like roars. It's like the same sound effect played like 20 times through the course of the movie. And it's awesome. Oh man. The thing I love about you talk about the intensity. It, it boils down, I think mostly to the filmmaking, which is this yes. camera is never, never still. It, it yes. just never is. It's moving yes. all the time. There's always yes. something going on on screen. The, the, only the, time- the whole bit with the helicopter where they try to like drop that, that Maureen guy oh, down that and then, crazy. and then you, and it suddenly cuts to like GoPro shots of his feet yeah you know and that's a that's an ahead of its time technique yeah. too 
he's trying using the, some using stuff the GoPro. People were, were trying at the time, and he's doing these super close up shots where the cameras are like feet away from the train. And some of that stuff, you you read the behind the scenes, and it's like the train was going like ten miles an hour, and then they just sped up the film because they was so close, it was too dangerous. And it really works here because if you don't have people on the screen, you can speed up the film, and it, you won't really be able to tell. And, and, and it works really well. It, it's just, it's an amazing achievement in action filmmaking. It's 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 so good for on from a technical execution level. What, what you're saying, Jay, is 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 like one of the things to help spot like good CGI. It's like when you when you start seeing like um, actual actors interacting with the CGI thing, your your brain starts like asking questions like, wait, but I know that actor is real. So, but right, now he's uncanny valley. Thing. But now the actor is holding this object that was given to them by a cgi character so like are they actually holding the thing or like you good cgi is when you start asking those kinds of questions yeah right? and there's yeah. very little cgi in this movie to be clear. right right right, right, right. yes yes so it so it so it every helps. time so this train hits something out of a helicopter yeah every time this, this train hits into something you you can you can feel the the impact of it the weight of it you're like oh my god that thing actually yeah, blew you're up you're truly like ooh that that seems dangerous so the one for me again <laughs> is when he you know, they got the horse in the middle of the train track and they're like oh I gotta get out of I gotta get off the track and then it runs uh runs into the trailer and, and it yeah really does and you see how the trailer just oh. like does like a spin like that's Crumbles how and spins how hard it and hits sprays yeah. yeah it's it's great it's great yeah it looks awesome. And it's not even, and like, what's the other thing that's great is like in those moments of impact, whether it's like that one train that derailed and exploded or the runaway train hitting, crashing into something. It's, it's great how Tony Scott would just show it up front. There's no fancy camera work or anything. He gives you a nice close up of impact, medium shot of impact, wide shot to show you the, 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 the overall result of this impact. Meanwhile, the train is still going. It's all like shown to the audience in like a very matter of fact way because it's a real thing that that they did on set. And like, yeah. that's one of the things that I think we, we critics champion all the time with action movies. Like um, I, I know Ryan and I and, and Sophia, when we talked about John Wick chapter four, we talk, when we talk about how good action doesn't need like, fancy cam doesn't always need fancy camera work fancy editing things like that to get in the way sometimes you just let the action and let the practical effect just speak for itself just let the camera sit there and film the thing because the thing itself is already breathtaking no especially when it has a sense of humanity to it which which is the tony scott special in my opinion and how about denzel running on top of a train oh my and god it's crazy a scared shitless he was the entire horrified. time <laughs> I was just like, oh my God. He was too. He I know he was. was. Scared of I was like, please yeah. do not let Denzel Washington fall. But he had to do the, he had to go and, and do it because like Chris Pine hurts his leg, which that terrified the hell out of me too. Cause it's oh, like that shot when like the grain is coming out. The grain's like the hitting his face. Oh, incredible. And incredible. It's so It's good. incredible. And I think incredible that one shot. is CGI augmented, but it's amazing. No. And I mean like the, the sense of, you know, Denzel's, what do, what do they say? It's like, uh, it, he's, he's different. Yeah. He's different. Oh my God. It's just like, you, you don't need some long speech. Like he hurt his foot. We need it. He's like, he's different. You know what I mean? Oh, no, it only, it only gets wordy when it needs to, when no. it is about building the characters. And other than that, it is such a visually propulsive film. It's a lot like what George Miller talked about with Fury Road. When you watch this movie. It is action and you the substitution the for itself yeah. of dialogue. You know what I mean? It's yeah. motion, it's movement, it's fluidity. It is the propulsion this moving so this good. thing forward. It is the it's the chase. That is enough dialogue for you as an audience to understand. It just hints you at milestones when he having to talk to Connie, and that's necessary for those characters in the moment to understand that. But it's also perfect enough. For us as an audience to understand at that moment where they're at, how far they are, what they have to do. There's not some, you know, they got to draw it out on a freaking map and explain you like, you know, quantum physics or any of that. Well, they are, they've got a train. They're going to connect it. 
we gotta we gotta slow this some bitch down and they know for a fact that the measures that this company is taking which is just, yeah it doesn't make sense you're gonna put these little brakes there to stop this behemoth of a train and also another thing that i found funny in that scene when the when the train runs over the brakes move the goddamn cop cars away <laughs> from the damn train tracks you mons like what are you doing like the other that, thing, the right other thing we haven't even talked about. It doesn't make any sense. The other thing we haven't talked about, 777 is Jaws in this thing, man. Yes, it, it is. They it, did yes, such it is. a good job of making it intimidating and really its own character. Yeah, it got that yes. red, that it's red. It's, it's so just intimidating. Mean they use and these green. really intense mm. otherworldly sounds when it's on the screen. It's, it, they did well, such it's, a good job of it. It's, it's like just a a, when it passes through by the kids, because that's what they're afraid of, right? At first, the first obstacle is getting. The the, oh, yeah, the field yeah, the, trip the, passed, the field yeah. trip, yeah. and the kids are like, "Whoa!" And you're yeah. like, "Thank God it didn't kill them all." You know yeah, what I mean? The girls <laughs> are like, "What do we love?" And the kids are like, "Safety!" <laughs> and you're safety. like, "And safety is coming to kill you." You know what I mean? Like, because that's what the straight is. It's like, I think if you were a parent at that time, you're like, "I'm never getting my kid on a train ever again." What a terrible idea for a field trip. Um, but yeah, it's, no, it, it they, is they did it such is a great a, job in making the train a character, even, even down to like color choices, given the fact that the oh, film yeah. is largely has a green and teal kind of look, it just makes the train's redness just stick out like I- immediately. Well, right. it feels like it's also in, in that way too. It feels like this train is defying the goddamn company that it's owned by. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it has and, a mind of its own. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then therefore when they're, using the brakes to pull it and they're like on the last you know break that they can to slow it down Mm -hmm. it feels like this unstoppable force i mean it feels like the goddamn unstoppable force it on top of force it feels unstoppable force um but it feels like it feels like the terminator (laughs) like like, no like for real like it feels like there's only one way to do this and it's just machine on machine battling it out Right. And and until like the last it breath, is, it is like a man-made monster. Yeah, and, and, and then it, and then it has awesome. and then it has like just enough of technical engineering explanations mm-hmm. to help sell the intensity more. Like like for example, when they finally latch onto the back of the train and they hit the brakes, those close-up shots of the speedometer. And you see that they're starting to slow down and you're like, okay, great, great. But then the speedometer like picks up speed again. Yeah. And you're like, what's, what's going on? And all it takes is for Denzel's character to s- explain like the, the whole train is too heavy. It's too big. We're being dragged now. And now, now you, you can imagine like, oh, the physics of it, of what's going on. And you're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh yeah, shit. How overwhelming yeah. the, the odds are. Yeah. And the movie and they- just has, the movie has just enough of like, technical stuff like like jay in the beginning of the episode was talking about things like you know the the air brakes and the throttle like the characters talk just enough jargon Mm -hmm. about these kinds of things even if you're not familiar with trains they help like ground the the logic behind it to help Mm -hmm. you understand why is this actually a big deal why is this actually a a disaster it's it's like any other disaster like when when we um from whether it's a i don't know like a like a plane crash or like even like the titanic like there's there's like people talking about the engineering stuff like how was the ship designed what caused the water to leak from one segment to another segment and things like that it becomes like a whole other rabbit hole that if you're interested you can go investigate into you know and so there is like this whole culture and this whole world of like trains and engineering that like Mm-hmm. Most people are not familiar with, but the movie helps you understand enough of it to un- to see like the like the gravity of the situation. It's great. Yeah. Me- totally. Meanwhile, um, what I was talking about before with like the news and the new and the broadcast, another thing that they do such a great job in this movie is the news broadcast will show like these simulations. They like simulate uh, Denzel and Chris Pine's. Uh, car like attaching to the back or they simulate the train not making the curve and exploding so like those simulations which news channels they do this all the time like cnn does it all the time right we've seen those kinds of 3d simulations but those simulations are like they they're very useful in storytelling they help 
keep the audience like on the same page. So we don't have to ask questions all the time. Like we're aware, we're very aware of the situation. We know how fast the train is going. We know how many miles out of this town. Mm -hmm. We know what needs to be done. We know what will happen if, if we fail. It, it's fantastic stuff. And how about when they sell Ethan Supley out on the TV where they're like, here's the guy who is responsible for all of this. Yeah, here's this <laughs> asshole. You know what I mean? I also they, uh, I love him and TJ Miller just like waiting. They got this train going and they're just waiting for the donuts to come in from oh, Rosario they got, they Dawson. They got two good idiots. Yeah, yeah, they got really two good idiots. And I love Ned. Him at like the coffee shop oh, hitting so on the waitress, good. and the waitress is like, not oh, that's interested a great at all. introduction to his character. And, and then and when then, he gives the speech at the end of the movie, yeah, it's all when, about precision. <laughs> the, no, it's not even just that, it's the fact that he changes clothes to a suit in with a hat and everything, and it's taken pretty much all the credit. It's like, of course, you do. He looks like a little cowboy giddy up shit, like, it's so perfect. That character. It could be an absolute just like oh, I, 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 you could hate that character but there's so <laughs> there's so much little hokiness about him that I love so much and I love when he gets there because he's late to get out there he meets T, you know Miller and Supley out there and he's like boy you both are just a bunch of idiots aren't you and then like when Pine who's got one foot and can barely walk he's just like jump you asshole like you know like he's like we only got I, i'm running out of road here and it's 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 just the little things in, in um in temple's performance that just add up to being so memorable i love you, it you know for it. some reason he remind his character reminds me of um philip seymour hoffman from twister oh a little bit i can see that i could see that just where it's just he's just a glue guy just makes this <laughs> You know who, I mean? who could who could easily drag down the movie but actually ends up great he's kind of nope. an arrogant idiot who's also secretly capable yeah yeah it's also you just you'd want to go get a cup of coffee at that diner with that guy no absolutely yeah. not he was insufferable <laughs> <laughs> i'll talk to you later i love also too like by the end uh like i love the daughters like dancing in the background they're like all right denzel go get rosario dawson you know like why not you know what i mean go on that date like Man, it's, it's it's so it's so underrated how it's crazy how Denzel and Rosario Dawson have such good chemistry and they don't even share the same shot until the end of the movie. Yeah, you know? it's so good at the end when she's like, All right, I, I, I'm trying to figure out which one of you to kiss first. And Denzel's like, it's, like, it's me, me. <laughs> Are you kidding? I get paid 20. I get paid 20 million. I go first. That's the Denzel. I mean? <laughs> that's what you pay Denzel for right there. Oh, my God. It's so it's. It's just a good movie. You guys got anything? What a else? great movie to watch. It's just yeah. Anything else you guys want to mention real quick? Because Tarantino funny. loves this movie. Oh, Tar- this is like Tarantino's like obsession. He thinks this is one of like the more. And he obviously more works with Tony films. Scott. Yeah, he's and, got. Uh, he, gotta, he loves this movie. This is his, one of his favorite movies of the 2010s. I wish he would put that up at the New Beverly in Los Angeles. Hey, Quentin, if you're listening, I'll be there in October. Um, put this up at the, on the big screen. I really want to see this thing on the big screen again. I don't know why this isn't played at like draft houses or or um, studio or like you know retrospectives because I feel like audiences would love the shit out of this thing. I think uh, this really has been completely accepted, canonized almost as one of the great action films of the last twenty years. Yeah, because I mean, you know, it's you think you think so, Jay? Because because like even though pe- people did really like it, I I don't really hear people talk about it though. There's a certain crowd, and maybe it's a smaller crowd than I'm considering, but there there's a certain crowd that really goes hard for this movie. Uh, stumps those would real hard be, for it. Those would be cinephiles. Those are called um, cool people. Yeah, like those are called people I'd like called to have a beer the with. Homies. Yeah, they're called the right people for this podcast. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, no, I mean, I agree, Jay. I think that if, I don't know, if like we did a top 50, it would definitely be in the upper echelon because of- Out of movies. action movies or movies? No, I'm talking about like action movies of the 2010s. Like it's definitely in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's absolutely- Movies, I mean, like, I don't know. There's like- I think Tony Scott fiction. probably has three <clears throat> in the top like 30. So, <laughs> Oh, of, of action films? Of the 21st century? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, he's definitely- Well, it's because he's also so 
again, very, very, very much an innovator. And I don't know many movies that are kind of comparable nowadays to a movie like this. Where And that's the other thing is that this is the end of a series. Where I think that's the last thing to talk about is, is the, why this is the end of a series. Well, I mean, this is an end of a series because one, we, you know, we, he tragically took his life and yeah. And we don't have him here anymore. This is a, this is, I mean, nowadays a movie like this does exist and it gets chastised. It gets pulled apart because look at how a movie like Furiosa did not do really well at the box office. That this, is, this I, movie is so much. The, the no, 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 comparison but just, to this movie is Ambulance. That is the closest thing to this movie that has come out yeah, in the last five years. But they weren't. Well, is Ambulance fi- was that financially successful? No, no, this wasn't that financially successful. But no, but I'm talking about a movie made by a pretty well liked guy. It was a disaster. Well, I wouldn't call it a disaster. Oh, a disaster. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I wouldn't say like people are like going to burn down Warner Brothers because of it. There's never going to be another Mad Max movie made. I know that. Well, well, yeah, but that was always that was always on the table. Though we always knew that that was going to probably happen. The first, the last one didn't wasn't financially successful. Pretty much, no, but it had a long tail. Yeah, I mean, it has the reputation of being probably the, depending on who you're talking to, the great film of the last decade. So like that helps yeah, it yeah. out. No, a agreed. Bit. I mean, I think um, is but a I fantastic think fantastic film. But I think that. For why I bring that up is because these are the kind of movies that they're rare. We want them to succeed, Jay. We want those movies to succeed massively sure. so then we can continue to see them be made. But they are becoming the canary in the coal mines. They are becoming the rules that are, you know, they're exceptions to rules now, you know, entirely. Entirely. And the problem is, is that a lot of filmmakers don't adapt or change enough. Like I think Tony did. And even still, when he didn't succeed, he was doing it with movie stars. And that's the other thing is that the, the, the death of the, or the, I guess the pause, or now we're in this sort of like, what is a movie star phase of Hollywood over the next 10 years? Because it becomes the IP becomes the focal point of movie making more than the person that's on the poster. Right. I mean, like that's gotta be big and that kind of hurts somebody like a Tony Scott or filmmakers. I think that that, is an interesting way to lead into what could have been with the end of Tony Scott, which I have a little bit of information on. All right. So he had a few, you know, he he was sort of in this Guillermo del Toro zone a little bit where he was attached to (laughs) five things at a time. Del Toro has like his hands in every cookie jar and and Marvel's kind of taken over and he decides the first thing, the first thing that he's hard attached to, you know, he was, he was thinking about doing a Grisham adaptation. He had some other cartel kind of movies that he was attached to, but the first one that seemed to be really the the gears were in motion was a, a comic book, a graphic novel adaptation called nemesis from Mark Millar who did, you know, um, Kingsman and kick ass mm-hmm. and wanted and all that stuff. Um, and this was nemesis is kind of interesting. It's like a reverse Batman is kind of the conceit of it. Mm. He has the exact same backstory of Batman, except he's a terrorist, a super villain kind of guy, which was kind mm. of interesting. That kind of fell through whatever, you know, he's got this Grisham adaptation with Shia LaBeouf. He was really attached to Shia LaBeouf at the time. He had a Jesus couple movies Christ. working with LaBeouf. He had a couple movies potentially being developed with Mickey Rourke. And, but then the thing that was looming over him at that point was Top Gun 2. Yeah. Top Gun 2 was the thing that he was maybe going to make. The thing that he was, was hard in development at the time was... The Wild Bunch. He was going to remake The Wild Bunch. Yeah, he and was. he was going to remake it not as a Western, but as a cartel movie, basically. Oh, um, I would have I would have seen the shit out of that. Yeah, oh I my mean, look, God. It's a Tony Scott movie. I, I would have. Yeah, uh, but like no modern. Life. But see, like, that's the thing. Like, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that, Jay, because then, like, he passes away and Denzel Washington, instead of doing probably the wild bunch, he remakes magnificent seven with Antoine Fuqua and it's possible a lesser version of that movie. And it's not, but again, look at it. That is a movie where Fuqua just essentially 
kind of copies and pastes the story, adds a couple of things, changes it up to not make it so like pound for pound the same thing. Tony Scott's taking the wild bunch and say, I'm going to put that in modern America. Gonna with the car- yeah. yeah. That's that's an innovator right there, folks. No, I, I, I agree. But Top Gun 2, again, is the thing. Yeah, that's, Tom that... Cruise gets attached. He's like, I'm going to I'll be in it. I want a small role. And Tom, Cruise Tom. says, you know who I want to write it? Christopher, Christopher McQuarrie. McQuarrie. <laughs> believe it or not, if you can believe that. But Christopher uh, McQuarrie couldn't crack it at the time. And so they they sent it over to the the guy who wrote the talent was was writing it at the time. Yeah. And then August 17th, 2012, Tony Scott meets Tom Cruise. They're very enthusiastic about making a Top Gun film. August 19th, 2012. Tony Scott jumps off the Vincent Thomas Bridge in L.A. and dies at the age of 68. Um, A tragic loss. The police said he did it without hesitation based on the footage that they saw. And that was uh, the end of the career and life of Tony Scott. And there were some rumors floating around about him having cancer or some instability or things like that. And that based on the autopsy, none of that seems to have been the case. Yeah, he wasn't on any sort of drugs. He was on like just a leveling amount of antidepressants. Nothing, um, no over prescribed, you know, over overdone dose of uh, of any sort of prescription drugs. It, nobody knows why he did it. There apparently was a suicide note that has never been revealed to the public, left in his office. It's just sort of a mystery and a very sad one. And I I I hate that we never got any more films from Tony Scott, but even more, I, I hate that everybody who loved him had to go through that. It's very yeah. sad. Uh, he's a, he's a legend in, in my book. So he is. I, I, I sad. it's, yeah, it's, it, I mean, the man brought so much joy, especially to so many people, but I think our generation a lot, um, the type of movies he made. And it's a big, what if question? I mean, you know, does the future of cinema would probably have a big print with him because he would have probably made something that we would have all just like gone crazy for. He probably, but you look at what he was making and he was sort of, we've talked about Ryan several times, a certain type of movie died with the death of Tony Scott, but it seemed like Tony Scott at the time was sort of adapting to the new age of, of cinema so it's sort of this catch-22 type of thing where it's i think you know, he, maybe he was going to morph into that new age of cinema which we don't like as much as when tony scott was able to make his avant-garde action films yeah uh, but then practical but, magic but if anyone could make maybe a cgi you know i don't think he mostly, ever would have done something quite like that no but like if if anyone could have tapped into I guess the, the the sensibilities of what the public wanted or what the public needed to see. He would have made enough of a compromise as well, while also now I think also integrity. I know, think he putting was so in, in his integrity. artistic element at the time that he was not terribly concerned with the no, but public he made, perception of no, but, but he, he was he, he made compromises. Movies, movies made. Yeah, he made compromises. I mean he makes a compromise. He was a studio he was a studio guy. Yeah, he very much was. And he made compromises and, you know, and, and I don't know what those, the case would be. I mean, like, you know, he also made the, Domino. He also, yes, he did <laughs> make Domino, but I also, I wonder you like too, I mean, since his passing, one of the biggest films since his passing is Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. And it is the biggest what if question because, and this is, again, this is not a shot at Joseph Krasinski at all, but I feel nothing in that direction for me personally. But I, I feel I think that movie but I feel, is better than Tony Scott's Top Gun. Yeah, but I feel like he would have, if he was given the opportunity and the tools and the technology, I think he, I think he would have given us even something even. It would have been a lot different. It would have been Top a lot Gun different. Maverick is a very sleek film in yeah. a way that Tony Scott was not interested in doing after. No, but I still like think nineteen ninety. I still think it would have been fascinating to see him behind the the wheel of that machine. Uh, easily because oh, i know i, I would know because because honestly like, he, no it does but like there's but to have him behind it it would have it would have happened 
You know what I mean? Because Top Gun Maverick is great. And also Kaczynski, when you hear interviews with him, he is very much like, I so wanted to capture kind of the West Coast fantasy that Tony Scott built with the original Top Gun. And I think he does that for the most part pretty well. No, for sure. But he's just also, he's not Tony Scott. He's no Tony Scott. You know know what I mean? And I think it would have been an interesting moment if, because that movie was so celebrated, it could have been a moment to for the world to finally celebrate him. The on one thing I will scale. say, Tony Scott's no. Top Gun 2 does not make a billion dollars. I don't know. I'm I, I almost don't, certain. Of I that. don't know. I, I'm with Jay that, on that one. I don't know. No, it makes $5 billion. Um, because, yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, like, that was the thing about that movie is, I mean, well, I mean, the first one was a ginormous hit. So I think either way, that movie was going to make a, a It was going to be successful, but not yeah. that. We'll never know. We will never know. We'll never know. And, um, but I, I, yeah, man, it's one of those where I sit there and I go, it's like with the Gore Bravinsky's of the world. And, it, and, 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 you know, it's, it's, we talked, you talked about Martin Campbell earlier, or it's, or even to a certain extent before Peter Jackson went full CGI, Raimi, why people love Raimi so much in, in, in those early Spider Man movies and things of that nature in, in his horror movies is because, there were directors that they made the big movies and they were not afraid to use practicality and they were not afraid to use emotionality and they were not able, they were able to, to tap into real characters with real actors and real emotions and have lightning in a bottle. And that early two thousands is, is the, the mid tier action movies in the mid two thousands rank up there better than most modern action films that come out currently something about was in the water maybe it's the screenwriters maybe it's the talent and movie stars maybe it's the directors and their visions or whatever but that era specifically or the wachowskis are another example of that too jay where they had something that now we don't have and many can't find and or studios aren't willing to allow them to have those risks anymore and it's a it's sad because many have tried to adapt i feel that tony scott because he has had so much success he's had failures he's had movies that were lukewarm receptions bombs at the box office bombs at critically or whatever and he's been able to then find in every decade a chance to be like give him another chance because he made a crap ton of money for us for this or people love this and movie he was or great to work with yeah all accounts on budget on time time pleasure to be around you don't get to work with Cruz and denzel and all these actors if you're a massive giant pain in the ass and people loved him yeah, and on, i'm checking he, uh who directed valkyrie a gentleman by the name of brian singer <laughs> <laughs> worked with Tom Cruise on Valkyrie. Didn't work I, I with just look, Didn't work with them like again, a, did he? Um. <laughs> I'm also I'm also just looking through a bunch of action movies that I don't think are terrible. They're like good or fine or some of them pretty good. Yeah. And thinking I I would rather watch the Tony Scott version of it though. Oh, I mean it's so true. Like which ones, Kevin? Like I love Edge of Tomorrow, but I would pick Tony Scott's Ooh. Edge of Tomorrow over Doug Ooh. Lyman. Yeah, that would be awesome. Like, I mean, yeah, Edge of Tomorrow at, is good. The ones that we Lyman discussed on this show are uh, because really, in many ways, Fuqua became Denzel's new Tony Scott. Yeah, the, the Equalizer, yeah, Scott, yeah. Equalizer, the Equalizer movies. movies yeah. Hello. Yeah. That feels. That, that feels like been, that would have been awesome. Yeah, those feel like a place where, like, because Denzel now just prints money for audiences. Honestly, Ryan, he does. To your to your point. It's it's really less about the practicality, although I think that's a huge part of it. But it's Tony, it's the heart that Tony Scott yep. movies have. It's what you talk really, about. It's it what you talk about with the Fest. Yeah, exactly. It could be a CGI super fest, but if I if I really feel a, a love for the characters and a sense of empathy and an experience of a, a, a truly emotional experience. Mm-hmm. You can have the CGI and all that stuff. And I won't love it as much as if it was this intense practical exercise, but that's the stuff that's missing more than anything yeah. because that's the core of storytelling. And, and that's what Tony Scott had. He's, yeah. he's a legend and I'm planting my flag eight to four Tony over Ridley eight to four. Well, do, do I, do I get a, you can get I get a vote. 
Yeah. Well, damn right I get a vote. I'm going to pick Tony. Nine to four. Or no, nine, nine to pick, five. Nine, nine, nine to, five? to five? All right, yeah. Dolly Parton. I'm down there. Working um, nine to five. Working nine to five. Um, I'm, I'm sad. This is probably like the saddest I've been in the years that we've done movie series. Hasn't Jake, it been a joy? It's just isn't been it such a delight. Really sad to talk about his suicide. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's the fact that with most of the directors that we've had, it's either been like, obviously older directors that passed away or we have the next film to talk about yeah. for modern directors. And he is a modern director. And, you know, I think that that's the hope that I also hold out for his brother a lot. It's just like, you and your brother are, are kind of geniuses in a lot of way and, and masters mm-hmm. of the craft. And I just would wish and pray to God you would learn some of the lessons that he taught, which is to be an innovator and scale some shit back. But really, is full balls to the wall. I'm going to make every movie a three-hour, four-hour director's cut epic at the cost of <laughs> an insane amount of money. And you want, you know, you want, you want one of the kind of tragic but touching stories about all of this so ridley was filming the counselor at the time of tony's death and there was one shot darius walski recounts that they were filming this shot in uh the michael fassbender character's apartment at the time and they were filming a shot of a window and ridley was like just open the window and walski was like this is supposed to take place in like Midwestern America. We can't really, this is Italy. They were filming in Italy. And they're like, I don't think we can show that. And he's like, just do it. And then he saw the the curtains floating in the wind. And he said, uh, you know, my brother was so good at shooting curtains. And then his brother was dead two days later. Uh, and he was, I mean, he was, in, he was incredible at it. That was, he had that, you, you look at films like the hunger and, um even deja many, vu. many others it was he had that painterly touch when it came to delicate moments like um like a sheer curtain uh he was uh he was a visual master yeah. he's he's one of the greatest action directors of all time and you shouldn't even belittle him by calling him one of the greatest action directors just of all time. Of he's just directors. one of the greatest directors of all time yeah he's uh I, I think he's awesome i don't think he's ever made a bad movie i love the films of Tony Scott. I think this, he's an important artist. Jay, thank you so much for, for making, for agreeing to do this and really being, he was the, you were the point of emphasis of doing this because you went on this run last year. Um, yeah. Two or three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this, I, yeah, this was fantastic. It's yeah. a fantastic series. We've had fantastic guests. We've had fantastic conversations. We've had a lot of laughs today. And so before we get out of here though, yeah, we got to Jay, I got to test your award season knowledge based on the movie we just reviewed, which was unstoppable yeah. in a segment we like to call. It's an honor to get nominated. Jay mm-hmm. was Tony Scott's last film nominated for any Academy Awards. So this was critically acclaimed, but I also feel like this was a period when action films were taking so unseriously mm. i am going to say it was nominated for zero oscars <sighs> jay you are in, you are incorrect okay nominated well, for an oscar we're talking we're talking about whether or not unstoppable got an oscar nomination yeah. yes yeah. yeah i think it got one did it get it, editing it got best achievement in sound sound editing. Sound, sound editing, editing. Mm, this was go. when the editing or the uh the categories were split and so it made it in there good I mean, for well him. deserved good for him hell yeah totally deserved totally deserved all right well now i gotta look up the nominees it lost to inception i believe which I mean, I, it's good, well it's good sound design it's good sound design for inception um this was the year of 10. So this was the year of, uh, this was the this year of the, the King's, King's speech. speech here. This is the King's speech here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that the, one has just aged so well. <laughs> yeah. Sound editing went to Inception. There was Toy Story 3, Tron Legacy, True Grit from the Coen brothers, and Unstoppable uh, was the sound editing nominees. I'm fine with Inception winning. I mean, it's, it's impressive. 
Honestly, Tron Legacy wouldn't have been a bad yeah. win in no, that. No, no, no. This is actually a pretty good best picture lineup, too. You think so? I do. Like I don't, King's, King's Speech, Black Swan, The Fighter, Inception, The Kids Are All Right, movie we're all talking about. 127 Hours, <laughs> The Social Network, Toy Story 3, True Grit, Winner's Bone. Yeah, I don't even love all of those movies, but as far as an eclectic group of movies that people really liked, and I think have a vision. I, I think it's a pretty good lineup. I'd probably kick out Winner's Bone and put it in Unstoppable. I, I like Unstoppable. Don't, don't do than, Deborah Granick dirty like that. I like she Unstoppable can get in for more than leave no trace eight of those oh. movies. But oh please, yeah, 2018, Leave No Trace. It's a great movie. No, I mean like, I really, I really would put, I really would put, I would put Unstoppable in this lineup. I would put it in. Well, you know, I actually. I would kick out 127 hours. Like that's I would kick out movies against time, against the clock, right? I would rather, yeah. you know what? I'll put that in there. I mean, whatever. Fair. <laughs> this is a big, good year, actually. It's a good year for movies. Yeah. 2010 is a good year. It's just, just a shame that the King speech beat single handedly one of the most important films of the last 20 years. I can years. come up with a great. 10 lineup for me personally and mcgruber is in the 10 spot hell i want that on yeah the would you put blue valentine in your 10 uh I yeah love, uh definitely yeah i that, love that movie, that movie i've i've i maintain that's the second scariest movie i've ever seen <laughs> what's the scariest movie you've ever seen synecdoche new york oh well yeah kevin that have you seen have you seen synecdoche a sense of absolute it's some pieces Oh, it's a terrifying movie. Yeah, that that's one if you're thinking about like the your life right now and you watch that and you're like, Jesus, we're really all just going to die soon. It's going to be really sad. I think everyone should watch that on their 40th birthday. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> Blue Valentine, watch, watch that with your spouse. Um, yeah, only watch that when you're married. Yeah, exactly. Only watch that when you're at your happiest. So you can uh, see that's a, a flash bachelor forward. party movie. Yeah, that's just yeah, everybody sit around. Let's watch uh, Blue Valentine. No, that's Fo followed by Manchester by the Sea. I yeah. think Blue Valentine. No, that's, for, that's, that's for when you're in the hospital with your pregnant wife. <laughs> <laughs> I do think Blue Valentine is. Uh, I love. I think that's Michelle Williams' best work, and I think that that's a uh, that's top tier Gosling for me. I He's agree. That incredible. movie. I, I really think that movie is is great. That's one where. At the time, Jay, he's got like, you know, Gosling's got a bunch of like, you know, he's turning into a movie star stuff. That's one where you're just like, oh, this guy's got more range than just. That's when he turns you know, to being kind of, I'm yeah. an actor's actor. Yeah. And then the and next li year, he's, literally the year before Drive. Yeah. Drive. Yeah. And he's got Drive, Ides of March. He's got uh, Crazy Stupid Love all in the same year showing his range. Yeah. Yeah. Gosling, Gosling's he's so good in Crazy Stupid when he, Love. When he wants the, the keys to the castle, Gosling's the, the movie star. But unfortunately, he can't get Fall Guy to make any money. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like, even The Fighter's a good movie. Like, no, I'm I like The Fighter. I'm happy Bale's got an Oscar because he's good in that movie. When are we getting David O. Russell on the pod? God, never, what? never. No, Your he's buddies been, with him. That's not true. <laughs> that is not true at all. Well, when are we getting Caviezel on? You were talking about him a lot. With I've been talk. I've been talking to him. He, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that he, I don't know that he's interested. We're not going to fit, fit in his MAGA schedule. No. Yeah. It's election season. He's pretty yeah, busy. Well, you know, well, well, oh, Russell's making that Linda Ronstadt movie with Selena Gomez. So that'll be great. That'll be your favorite movie of the year. Um, well, we've talked about this year before, cause this is the year of Unsandees, mm. uh, in foreign language, which is a movie you and I don't, don't like, for. um, yeah. yeah. So I remember when we were like, got to this segment of the show, we were like, uh, we're not going to nominate it for anything. And we'd actually take it out of the international yeah. feature and, and, and everything. So. Not the first or last time that'll happen, but it, probably yeah, didn't, so. didn't, didn't love that movie. No, but um, yeah, I mean, I would put this in, I mean, I would consider this an editing. Absolutely. Editing. Yeah. Sound. Editing sound, I the, the I'd, I'd production design. Picture, I'd put it in picture. I'd put it Just in director. Can you put it in production design for building all those or having the trains and the set pieces? I think that might be a little right. bit of a tough ask. All right. Um, 
costumes, that yellow vest. <laughs> Makeup? Nah. It's a dirty city. Dirt, you know, it all the coal mine, city. you know, coal. I think um, it, you could you could make an argument for cinematography just as far as the helicopters and the close up cameras, yeah. the ingenuity of the cinematography. I well, think cinematography was worth talking about. Cinematography was um, uh, Wally Pfister for Inception One, and Matthew Lipatique for Black Swan, Danny mm-hmm. Cohen for The King's Speech, Jeff Cronenworth for uh, uh, The Social Network, and and Deacons for True Grit. Deacons and True Grit. That's underrated. Deacons. That's a that's a really good Deacons. Yeah. Honestly, people True Grit is that. that's a movie. That's one of the cons that elevates every time I watch uh, it. Yeah. Honestly, which is funny because I don't hear people talk about no, that I movie know. often. Yeah. No, but it's yeah. it's so great. So because it's, it's like sandwiched in between the era of like and it's a remake. No Country and yeah. and yeah and it's before Lou and Davis. So people talk about that, but like yeah, people. I mean, it's a it's one that I think is better than the original. That's for sure. I mean, um, true, true grit is was my uh, number four of the year. Yeah, that sounds about right. Sounds yeah, yeah. it's a top tenner for sure. I take King's Speech out and put Unstoppable, and I honestly would keep. I would take King's Speech out of uh, editing too, for God's sakes. I think there are definitely some some nominations for Unstoppable, but film editing that year, I would keep it because that's the Social Network won film editing, and that's a pretty yeah yeah. Social a, Network would win a textbook, lot of these textbook editing. That's a, textbook effective piece of editing this is the year the wolfman won for uh best makeup honestly deserved I I, I'm, 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 I'm not going to complain about that uh, that's, honestly that's the master no, I mean, rick the makeup, baker the at work is good yeah rick baker at work all right so it's a good movie should we, should we rank the tony scott movies i think it's time i think it's time we do this at the end of every series where we rank the films in the totality uh, Jay's seen all the films. I've seen all these films. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to be nice to to rank these things in their full 16 films in total. Mm-hmm. Jay, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'll go first. So 16 films. Number 16 for me is Spy Game. Uh, wow. I think, uh, I think a disappointing film, but again, not a bad film. Great conversation Beverly- we had on that show. Yeah, absolutely. Beverly Hills Cop 2 is my number 50. The Fan at 14. Number 13, The Taking of Pelham, 1, 2, 3, 12, Days of Thunder, 11, Top Gun, which might make some people mad, but 10, The Hunger, 9, Enemy of the State, Revenge at number 8, Domino at 7, Unstoppable at 6, which feels rude, it is especially rude. after um, right after talking about it, 5, The Last Boy Scout, 4, True Romance, 3, Deja Vu. Mm. Two Crimson Tide and my number one man on fire. All right. You ready? I'm ready. I want to see how different these are. My number 16 is The Fan. Okay. My number 15 is The Taking of Pelham 123. Mm. 14, Beverly Hills Cop 2. 13, Spy Game. 12, Top Gun. 11, Days of Thunder. Mm hmm. We're pretty. We have the same six so far, just in a different order. Ten revenge. Mm-hmm. Nine the hunger. Eight enemy of the state. Seven true romance. Six domino. You have it h- ranked higher than me. I'm shocked by that. Yeah, that's wow. embarrassing by you. To get out of here. But the thing is, I think I like domino more than you do. But I just they're. Yeah. It's so it's so funny because Domino is one of the movies I have not seen because I've heard bad things about people, Domino. People, you gotta people see it. it. It's yeah, it's wild. It. It's a wild movie. If you talk about that two thousands aesthetic that you're talking about, Kevin, I know, I are, know. Jump in the deep end, like Kevin. Domino. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm jumping straight into. Um, number five, Tenet Junior. Deja vu. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is Tenet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's Tenet, Tony it's, Scott's Tenet. It's Tenet yeah. Senior and Tenet is Tenet Junior. Yeah. Yeah. Also Tony Scott's Vertigo, let's be clear. Yeah, that too. Four, Unstoppable. Mm-hmm. Three, The Last Boy Scout. Wow, three. I love that. Mm-hmm. Holy freaking rules. And then we got the same two, but I assume in a different order. Number two is Man on Fire. Number one is Crimson Tide. Yeah, not that different. Not that different, but it's like hairs. It's like, pull, a little, it's bit, like little, you know. little differences. Yeah, but the last Boy Scout. God. Yeah, I think the ones that are surprising. You had the last Boy Scout at three, four, three, three. 
Yeah, three. Yeah, that's that's wild. I mean, I had it at five, but that movie uh, is insane. It's awesome, and I kind of did a that's... great job of selling it too. On our, no, on our he really episode. did, but he didn't have to sell me because I was watching that movie. I'm like, why don't I have more of these? Agreed. Yeah. Like that's the that's the one in this series. It I sat there and I'm like, challenging movie. This mm-hmm. movie has no right to be made, and yet I want six more of these now. Like this, this would be. Yeah, and I'm and Willis and Wayne's in that movie, insane. Yeah, Domino's high for me. Uh, you asked me a question before the podcast, I believe, which is Unstoppable versus Deja Vu. They're both rated the same. I just, you know, I just like a, the uh, yeah, Unstoppable effect, a smidge higher, just a smidge. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, flip a coin, I'll say Man on Fire because Man on Fire makes me cry like a baby. Man but then Crim- a masterpiece. I think Crimson Tide is just again that's that's the efficiency of Tony Scott. It's a pretty perfect movie. It's Hackman. It's Denzel. It's that ensemble. It's um, yeah, it's all good. So, so I think the ones the ones D- that Denzel like, four out of the five in my top yeah that's top crazy. five yeah maybe I like him. He's got, he's got four out of my six. Yeah, the ones that I like more than you. I like True Romance more than you. Yeah, that's yeah. I like. It was the first time watch for me during the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I yeah. forgot about that. Um, so it'll grow probably. You like honestly, the rest were kind more. of in like. I think I like Revenge more than you do. Yeah, weirdly, I like Spy Game more than you, but that's just you definitely like Spy Game more than I do. I think it's a fascinating film, even though it's a flawed film. Yeah, it should be better. That movie should be better. I the Hunger is also higher on your list than it is on mine. Yeah, The Hunger is number nine, and you're like, this is an absolute banger. I'm like, I was yeah, it's 10. really It good. is a banger. Yeah, it's a banger. Yeah. I got Revenge um, 10. That's fun. That's fun. It's fun. That's fun. Well, before we kick Kevin out of here, we got a big announcement. We got to announce the next oh, movie yeah. series. This is big. This is, this is big. This is, you want me to do it? Yeah, you can do it. We're doing kind of a similar director, so you can you can talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, because when when I think of our our next movie series, I really think of the films of Tony Scott mm-hmm. as parallels. Um, no, we're 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 leaving Tony Scott behind, and and uh, we are going to be starting next week the movie series on Terrence Malick. Yeah, that is who we will be tackling the next couple of weeks. We're going to do the whole. We're doing the whole thing. We're doing all nine, right? We're doing all nine. Yeah, Ryan, I'll, I'll just spoil it for people that make it this far. Let's say it. My favorite director of all time. Yes, we did my oh. favorite director last, last year with PTA. So it's only right that we did Jay's this year. I'm not going to say that he's been terrified and uh, oh, yeah. about this whole process because, I mean, if anyone's seen Terrence Malick's movies, you know it is a... It's daunting. It's daunting. Uh, you Jay, sound like how, a big dumb idiot. <laughs> Jay, do you have a, how many books do you have for this? Five. Five books. It's a lot of research. It is. But uh, we're excited. We got guests for most of them, familiar faces and, and voices that you've heard before that we decided to have come back and talk about this series. It's a very important series for us. I'm looking forward to it. Next week, our first episode will be over Badlands. Mm-hmm. I'm super excited to get into the world of of Terrence Malick. I can't wait for uh, for just you know as a, a, a some you know dialogues about to happen and he just whips a camera over at a tree for like four minutes. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great stuff. And that tree shot is gonna be about the ex- uh, existentialism of the world. Um, and then so, I cry. And then I cry like a big old baby. Uh, yeah. No, I'm looking forward to it immensely. And there's some of these movies I haven't seen. In a while, I, obviously, I know Jay is like, you know, there's a lot of them that you you watch on rotation. Maybe one of them is a really, really high on your list of all time films. Yeah. But I'm actually even more curious about the back half of the series post the floaty, Tree of Life. Floaty Malik. I like. I'm really fascinated to have those conversations with our guests about Floaty Malik. Um, yeah. He's a wacky, flavorful arm man, tube man. That guy at that point. Um, Kevin. Thank you so much for coming on and capping off this Tony Scott movie series with us. Can you tell everybody where they can find you and all your work on the internet, my friend? Yeah, yeah. You can find all my work on wordswatch.com, filmimquery.com, and thatshelf.com. Go follow Kevin. He's got stuff up on the site. He's 
always around. Go follow him on the internet. If you're still on Twitter, for the love of God, if you want a good follow, follow Kevin. Um, there's not many of them out there left, but Kevin's a good follow. Jay? Oh, Kevin, do you have a movie recommendation of the week for everyone? We usually give a, a recommendation out to everybody. Oh. It doesn't have to be new. It can be something old. Um, of the week? Yeah. No, Damn. it doesn't have to have come out this week. What's a good no. thing you've watched recently? Yeah, what's something that um, you watched recently and you're like, yeah, the movie rules. Everybody should watch it. <laughs> oh, I, I recently introduced my girlfriend to Bo Burnham. So uh, for the first time since it came out in 2021, I rewatched Bo Burnham's Inside. Oh. And that was also the same time that I learned that he had an, another hour of behind the scenes footage and cut songs. So it was also like a new experience for me. I, I tend to not look these kind of stuff up. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought the special holds up really well. Um, I know it was like very focused on the pandemic then, but I think a lot of the stuff that he was saying in it, I think they're still, if not more relevant today. So, yeah, still available on Netflix. Okay. All right. Jay, uh, I don't think I've recommended this one. Correct me if I already have. Well, tell everybody where they can find you first. Oh yeah, Jay Ledbetter on Letterbox, Mister Jay Ledbetter on Twitter. Any writing I'm doing, go on Awards Watch. Recommendation of the week, Ryan. I don't think I've have I recommended a Perfect World. I don't think so. I don't think so. Clint Eastwood film, A Perfect World. I was doing kind of a Costner thing in honor of him losing a hundred million dollars on the production of uh, horizon part one. And I had not seen a perfect world before. It is a film about Kevin Costner plays a, a prison escapee who kidnaps a, a young boy and Clint Eastwood plays the, the kind of sheriff tracking him down. And it is such an understated movie considering how that plot sounds and Costner I think is so good Eastwood is so good Laura Dern has an amazing supporting role in it and it's so emotionally engaging I think it has this incredible sense of empathy to it which Clint Eastwood really can have in, in his best films and so I recommend uh, A Perfect World it's a prison break movie that is unlike any prison break movie you've seen before so check that out I've been dying to watch this because you know me, I'm I'm really fascinated by Clint as a director. He makes so many just wildly interesting choices. In his yeah. 90s run. Early 90s. Clint yeah, is, is incredible. Out of this world. Yeah. And then when he does in the 2010s is gobbledygook. Um, but it's not it's, always. A lot but of it's too. fascinating. It's fascinating. I would love to do a series on him. But Sully, Ricky Jewell. There's, Those are good. There's so many movies. Uh, and you would have to talk about the bad ones, too. You know what I mean? There's, it there's is a, so many movies. We so probably make movies. that like a tenor. <laughs> and you <laughs> would feel like you were leaving a lot of stuff. Yeah, out. we're leaving a lot on the table. Um, you can find my work over at awardswatch.com. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox at Ryan McQuaid 77. Uh, if you like podcasts, Mondays, we release the Awards Watch podcast. Kevin, Jay, everybody on the team is a part of them. Uh, over on the website, sign up for the newsletter. Best place to get all the news, reviews, interviews, podcasts all in one place sent to you throughout the week. Uh, the other the other thing is five stars on iTunes and Spotify. I uh, Recommendation of the week. I saw a movie that came out this year. Jay reviewed it on the website. And, and I've been trying to play some catch up since we're at around the oh, a little over the halfway point of the year. I watched this movie called The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Good. Guy Ritchie's latest film. And I've got to tell you, this was a good movie. And Guy Ritchie, no. is, Guy Ritchie is in this world. I very fun. Very fun time. I very it. fun time. I I, it time. is Guy Ritchie's discount, almost like Inglorious Bastards in a lot of ways. Oh, it is. So yeah, it looked like Bastards. that. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it is a, it's just a rip it's a hell of a time. Fun time. Good vibes. Cavill's amazing in this movie. He's great. Um, Alan, wow. no, Al Richson, right? Is that no, like the the yeah. R Jack Reacher, Reacher guy? Um, he's fantastic in this movie. And um, yes, yeah, listen, I gotta tell you this about Guy Ritchie. 
who would also make for a fascinating movie series. Um, Richie is a guy that he's got a little bit of the blood of Scott in him, a little bit in Bay, you know, but he takes detour no, sometimes. He's a, he's a rip off Tarantino as well. No, is. well, I mean, and not just because of the Inglorious Bastards. He's stuff. been that his whole career. Yeah, but I think he's got, I think he makes largely entertaining, sometimes elevated action movies. And then there's other times, though, more it's recently. One of the worst movies I've ever seen. Swept which away. Which one? Oh, swept away. Oh, okay. oh my God. Well, you could, that's the other thing. He, he, he goes from, he can make a really good movie to then making like a really bad movie. There's not really much of a middle ground, but you've liked the last couple of his movies. You like this. You like the I covenant. Like Guy Ritchie. You yeah, like the I, covenant, I, I, right? I like Guy Ritchie. Yeah. Yeah. He did that. What was it? That operation. Uh, oh, that one was, that one was bad. The one with Jason Statham. Yeah. Oh, operation fortune. Yeah, that's right. I liked the gentleman, which has spawned a pretty successful Netflix. I really series. liked the gentleman. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Hugh Grant and the gentleman. That was my supporting actor. Mm-hmm. That one. Wow, I forgot about that movie. Yeah, well, I'm also was... one of. I'm also one of the ultimate King Arthur defenders. Oh god, <laughs> I, not... I think that movie is good. I've been. I'm a massive fan of Rock and Roller, which is um, a movie he made right before. Yeah, I mean, I going back, doing that. I, I think the Sherlock Holmes movie is a lot of fun. That, that was a lot of fun. Not as into the sequel, but the first. Yeah, one the first one's really fun. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't mind if they made another one of those. Um, but anyway, yeah, go and catch it. It's on iTunes right now. You can, you can rent it. I think it'll be on a streaming platform soon, but yeah, it's, it's a really fun movie. And, um, he has this from what I could gather in, 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 it's very funny, but like Richie's able to just like, kind of going to throw out the script and we're just going to kind of go on the outline and the vibes of it. And it's very loose and very, and and very vibey. And you just, you're just having a fun time with it. So if you like seeing Nazis getting brutally, brutally murdered, you'll have a good time. You have a good time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So next week we'll, we'll be back. We'll, we'll be starting our Terrence Malick movie series. We'll be start uh, we'll be starting to talk about his first film, Badlands. So thank you all so much for listening, and we will see you all next time.